Hot steaming lure here. Hot steaming lure. Oh, Come gross. on down for the husband and wife duo who are going to take that hot steaming lure and go back and forth forever. Oh, no. That's right. It's Pearl Mania. What have I signed myself up for? Uh, you signed yourself up for a marriage that will never end. Oh. It's Pearl Mania 500. Whoop, whoop. The podcast where a husband and wife duo research a topic yep. and then scream it back and forth at each other. This week, it's my topic, Mr. P. So Mrs. P is going to sit there and she's just going to take it. Ooh. Oh, just gonna take it. Okay, God, ow. There's a place where you can't stay when the world gets too insane. Yeah, when the world gets too inane, tune in to Pearl Mania. Brony talks. Thank you so much once again. To his name was Dusk. Woo! Uh, he, uh, he sent me a text the other day. He's like, "You keep saying my name wrong again." I was like, "Ah, it happens." Past tense, present, present tense. tense, it's future he's tense. He's still Dusk. He's always going to be. He was Dusk. Well, uh, his name was Dusk. Anyway, welcome to Pro Mania Five Hundred. Yep. Uh, it's another episode. We're here. Another fun time. Ugh. This is the last episode we're recording before many of you will see me live. At Helium Comedy Club in Philadelphia next week. Whoop, whoop. We are very close to selling out the final tickets. Hell yeah. For the now 3.30 p.m. show. Oh my God, it's going to be so early. I it's going it. to be so early. We are going to be oh, home. I'm going to eat a nice lunch. We're going gonna... to get in the car and then we're going to drive into the city. Mm-hmm. And then uh, we're going to go to the show. We're going to have a good time. We're going to have all the teehees. Yep. And then at a very reasonable hour or two later, we're going to yep. get in our car. We're going to drive home, and we're going to put on PJs. At like, at like 6 o'clock in the afternoon. Absolutely. fucking It's going to be like day six, over. It's going to be 6 o'clock. We're going to be nice done. lunch, outside activity. That's immediate time for bed. Yeah. I don't have to do anything else. Sun's still going to be up. I don't care. And we're going to be in bed. <laughs> yes. As we announced on the last episode, we are very close to our stretch goal of the Pearl Mania 500 500. Oh, you better get your library card ready. Oh, man. We are so close You're where have to read a book. when we hit the 500 uh, active Patreons at the same time, uh, I will be forced to read a book that mm. uh, Mrs. P will take uh, different suggestions for, yep. a few of which she's actually already received a couple. And uh, we will also uh, then put it up for a poll. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, well, yeah. no, it's going to work. People are going to send me suggestions. Yes. And then I'm going to go through, do a quick review of see which ones are the best. Yeah, I'm gonna you're going to pick take a top, top three. three. Yep. And then I'll put up a poll of the top three book suggestions. And then whichever one is picked, uh, we'll go to the library. We'll get it out. And then Alex will read it. And then he'll have to do a book club episode. Yep. So if you want to join the Patreon to help us hit this stretch goal. If you want to join the Patreon to help force Alex to read a book. it's uh, You can either go to alexisanerd.com or patreon.com slash Pearlmania500. Link is in the show notes. Yeah. Uh, so with that, let's meet because we had a lot of new Patreons Yeah, this people week. are ready to people, spitefully support us to make you read. People really want me to read a book that doesn't have pictures in it. <laughs> um, and that's... I am people. <laughs> So let's meet. I also joined the Patreon. So let's meet our three dollar and five dollar Hey Huns and Team Leads. Hey Huns, let's meet our team leaders. All right. So this week we have quite a few people. We're gonna start off mm-hmm. with the Post Potato Snork. Yeah. Now Post Potato Snork actually sent in a very valid question, an important question, because we've talked about Post Potato versus Pre Potato yep. on this podcast many times. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, even possibly working on merch for a post potato, pre potato yeah, world. Yeah, it's our uh, a, a BC versus AD. Yeah, because a lot of people, you know, argue about AD versus BC versus BCE mm-hmm. versus CE, and we'd say pre potato, post potato, yeah. and because uh, the world only matters 
whether or not you're able to eat a potato or not. Yeah, and po- post potato snork, um, who th- I love the name. Yeah, because snorks were better than the Smurfs. I'm glad uh, we can agree. Post potato snork uh, asks, when is post potato? Well, no, when is potato? When is potato? You need a, a you need central a, an moment, actual moment, a moment that is potato to now, have a pre and a post. Now, here's the thing: is when we were discussing this and we were talking about pre and post potato, I was talking about the European world mm-hmm. because obviously potatoes existed in Peru and mm-hmm. the Andes this entire time. Yeah, if you were in South America, you had potatoes. Yeah, you always did. You lived a blessed life oh, full my of God. potatoes. So happy, so many different colors of potatoes. Yeah, it was a great life. What a time! Um, but I've gone through, and mm. uh, so did post potato snork, and noticed that there's a lot of different dates, potato moments, big yeah. potato moments in history. Do we go with the moment that the potato was found? Uh, when it was uh, what's introduced, it called? colonized by yeah. Spain. <laughs> when when a conquistador was like, "What are you eating? Dirt?" And then they're like, "No, it's delicious." And it's like, "Oh my God, I have so many ideas." Um, do we go from that date? Mm-hmm. Do we go from the date when it was first introduced uh, to some areas of Europe? Or do we go specifically to when Sir Walter Raleigh introduced it to the Irish? I mean, that's an important moment. It's a very it important moment. the game, really. <laughs> now, I went through and uh, read a couple different um, academic research papers about this. <laughs> and there's one issue that you run into a lot. Mm-hmm. Is you see there's two types of potato. Okay. There is a Solanum tuberosum. Yep. Which is your classic potato. Tube. The one, the tuber, yep. the one we like. And there's also Ipomia batatas, which is a sweet potato. Love those too. And in Spanish, because they're the ones who found them, mm-hmm. they often talk about patatas mm-hmm. and batatas. Okay. Patatas? Yeah. That's potato. Yeah. Batatas, with a B, that's sweet potato. Okay? You mm-hmm. follow me? Yep. So um, there was some confusion there about that. Of which one are they talking about? And so after dialing it all the way back, there was finally, there was a document that stated that barrels of patatas, potatoes, Mm -hmm. were exported from the Grand Canary Islands to Antwerp in November of 1567. Okay. So to me, since we're doing a, even though it's not religious, but it's still a Eurocentric division of time. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go with November 1567 is the moment of the potato. That is the moment of the potato. Now, because again, because they were first seen in 1532 by mm-hmm. the Spanish, it took time for them to get to the Canary Islands. They had to be planted in the Canary Islands. They didn't have to grow as a bumper crop mm-hmm. and all those different things. So I would say 1567 is potato and everything after 1567 is post potato. Got it. The mo- the true moment. So then, did the but- batatas, the sweet potatoes, they came later. It's like around the same time, huh? Yeah. It's just like sweet. It's just like French fries. It's like yeah, I'll I'll take sweet potato fries if I have to. Mm-hmm. But I want I want those pata- pata- patatas. Patatas. <laughs> <laughs> so so the the year. But the- there's some certain things that sweet potatoes really rule at. Yeah. I mean, listen, Thanksgiving is fast approaching. Yep. And soon will be time for a potato casserole, a sweet, like you get regular potatoes. You're not going to put marshmallows and maple syrup on them. Okay. So that was one out okay. of the 25 okay. people we have to greet today. It was an important one. I had to make sure that we talked about so it. So thank you so much, Post Potato Snork, for your wonderful question <laughs> as and, well. And now we're in agreement when and now potato is. we're in agreement. So we're going <laughs> to bang out a couple real fast. At first, we have Krista Kampke. Hey, hon. After that, we have Steven, everyone's favorite, Ross. Hey, hon. After that, we have Nick Bunting. <laughs> After that, why do you giggle at that? Because I have a lot of opinions about bunting, and you know you that. You do actually. That's actually very funny. You do have a lot of bunting opinions. Uh, after that, we have Jessica Valdez. Hey, hun. After that, we have Alyssa Redden. Hey, hun. After that, we have the Bring Back the Alex Jones audio clip. A valid concern. Yeah, valid concern. Let's go. Weird part about the Alex Jones audio clip. It makes the frogs gay. Well, beyond that, mm-hmm. something weird happened with my phone where it deleted the audio. <laughs> of just that because I when I found it as a TikTok that sounds like the Matrix at it work really do <laughs> it, it was like weird I'm like did Tim Apple go on my phone and was like yep. no no Alex Jones for you good sir yep that's what happened uh, he's being silenced by big media after that we have Delita wasn't wrong <laughs> after that we have nude DJK J- hey on or nude JK nude. maybe nude JK nude J it's all one it's N E W D J K maybe it's like I'm new JK I've been here. Mm, I feel like they spelled nude wrong, like they're naked. And then they went, just kidding. That's what <laughs> it reads way, to like me. It. Hey, hon. After that, we have Cedric Ferguson. Hey, hon. 
After that, we have I Love You Babes equally. Thanks, and I just want to say thank, you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. thank you. thank you. Because a lot of people come in and they're like, Mrs. P is my favorite. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, or other people will write like, uh, Alex stinks and we hate him so much. <laughs> That's just or me. They'll write, signed up for Or they'll write, uh, <laughs> they'll write underscore Alex underscore Perlman underscore huh. is uh-huh. underscore the <laughs> underscore worst underscore mm-hmm. Host of underscore mm-hmm. Pearlmania 500 underscore Mrs. underscore P <laughs> underscore four <laughs> underscore life, but life is spelled with a Y. That's, I mean, you can't argue that kind of quality name. That is not actually someone's name, but that could be. Yeah. Uh, and that's usually how it feels like <laughs> when I read them. After that, we have Yelra. Hey, hon. After that, we have Matt Habs. Hey, hon. After that, we have Hogwarts. You're, um, you're a Hufflepuff. But fuck you. <laughs> I am such an elder millennial that I didn't read Harry Potter. Okay, well, that's really funny. I've weird. never read Harry that's Potter. That's really weird. I've only watched the movies and thought that they were, all right. They're okay. They're pretty I, good. I read the books. You read the books? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> After that, we have Black Cat Wife. Hey, hon. I think you looked at their toe beans and oh you, saw, you saw what color, what what color, color is your cat? Toe beans. Yeah, what color yeah. toe beans? After that, we have Jesse Panic. Hey, hon. That's a cool nick, uh, name if you did roller derby. That is a pretty cool. It's a good roller derby name. Yeah. If you consider it. After that, we have just here for Pearl Mania 500. I believe they mean the Pearl Mania 500. Okay. They want to make me read a book. Yeah. Uh, after that, we have that one chair from the Montgomery Brawl. Oh, the most famous chair of That's the ball. That's a great chair. The Game of Thrones chair, done. Nobody gives a shit. Bad ending. Montgomery Brawl chair, yeah. great ending. Best chair. Yeah. Chair of the board. What are you doing? I have to check something real oh, quick. Oh, no. He's Googling. Uh, he's Googling. What is he Googling? I'm just pulling up a quote. Well, I also just don't love, uh, what's it called? Dead Air. Okay. Well, I know you don't, which is why I am trying to get you to read mm-hmm. the, in, you know, to read the thing. Okay. And all right. All right. I don't need to. Okay. Listen, you're the one who didn't help. All right. <clears throat> <laughs> I'm the one who didn't help. You didn't. You could You could see when I'm doing something. You could feel yeah. the dead air time. What do you want me to talk about? I don't know. Things. Okay. Stuff. What did I eat today? Okay. This is getting boring. So I let's go frittata. ahead. And, <laughs> after thanking the, the one chair from the Montgomery Brawl, mm-hmm. let's thank, so I lied. I cheated. Okay. I bribed men to cover the crimes of other men. I'm an accessory to murder. But the most damning thing of all, I would do it all again. Whoa. What is that from? That... That is from Star Trek Deep Space Nine. That is Cisco admitting that he faked oh, the footage right. with a Romulan senator. Yeah. I had to look up the quote because it was half cut off because they ran out of space. Well, it's a great quote. It's insane how many characters Patreon allows you to use for a name. <laughs> I love it. I was like, why do I know this quote? And I was reading it. I was like, oh my God. After that, we have Celine Parker. Hey, hon. After that, we have Alyssa Brown. Hey, hon. Ale- after that, we have Alex P. Mania 29.95. Yeah, you're on sale, twenty nine ninety five. Oh, that's pretty good. Yeah, it's a pretty good deal. After that, we have Chris with a K. Hey, Chris. Is that our friend Chris? Could be. Might be. Might be. I know she's been listening for a long time. Yeah. After that, we have a girl named Thumb. A girl named Thumb. And finally. Okay. What a great ending. All right. Let's hear it for Juggalo Mania 500. Let's go. That's such an amazing, that's uh, such an amazing way. Who doesn't way to... love Juggalos? Well. Hey, huh? Let's meet our team leader. The answer was mall cops. That was the answer. Yeah, which I am a former mall cop. Going to mark those as complete. <laughs> Just, I like the way you said that, the way that people like say that they're ex-Marines. <laughs> I, you know. You're like, I serve my country. One of my favorite parts. <laughs> I is, did my time. One of my favorite moments as a stand-up comedian was mm. I was sitting at a table with some comics and I just happened to mention yeah, you know, when I used to be a mall security guard, and one of them just leaned forward, put his hand on mine, and said, "Thank you for your service." <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know who was I, gonna who was gonna ju- who was gonna guard Abercrombie and Fitch? Uh, this guy, this guy right here. All right, I didn't see any of you out there. Mm-hmm. All right, there was a thin minimum wage line. <laughs> It's like what color? I did not. I did not make that much what money. What color represents the mall security guard? I think guards? it's like a. I think it's like a beigey yellow. Yeah, it's definitely an off off white. Well, they have sort. when you go now. It, I've seen it. I pointed it out to you before. 
the the thin line shirts. Yeah, where it's not just not just blue for the cops, not no. just red for the firemen. Paramedics. They have paramedics on there, and the people that answer the phone. Yeah, the dispatch. The dispatch. But they yeah. also have like prison guards on there. And well, it's like corrections. I was like, nah, come on, all right. I mean, recently in recent news, the corrections officers have been getting a bad name. <laughs> All right. They're letting them loose. Yeah, well, I think they always get a bad name. Yeah. Um, yeah, especially in our neck of the woods where we've had a man running through the woods with guns. But enough about murderers in the woods. Okay, great. Uh, let's talk about something a little because we have, we have a big announcement. Yep. Big um, news. Yeah. So You want uh, me to say it? Yeah, so So you we've say been it. keeping a secret. A major secret. <laughs> it's not that major of a secret, I don't think. No. Um, uh, a lot of people are doing it. No, we are pregnant. Yes. And I have been for a while. Yes, you are very... <laughs> I like when people say we're pregnant, but I'm like, no, no, no. Yeah, we're having... I'm pregnant. Yeah, we're having a baby uh-huh. uh, this December. Yep. Uh, but with the show coming this weekend, Yeah. Uh, we wanted to give everybody the heads up because you are going to be at the show. I'll be there. But you might be a little standoffish. I might be standoffish. With a mask on. You know, I'm going to be a little... Just taking precautions. Yep. I'm, you know, I'm not going to... I'm going to try desperately not to be like too standoffish, but I definitely... Uh, I'm going to be surrounded by a lot of people, so I want to yeah. like take some precaution. So I figured I should announce it. Also, it's funny if you just show up and you're like, whoa. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, that lady's pregnant. Yeah, that lady's, <laughs> I, I hope she's pregnant. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, but yeah, so we've been we've been going through this for a while now. Yeah. Baby's mm-hmm. coming in December. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we've been making some changes and things like that. But we've also been making plans for... You know, how we can uh, keep still delivering benefits to the Patreons. Yep. Uh, we are pre-recording right now episodes and things. Yeah, uh, so we're that bringing on special like guests. A, a maternity leave style situation yep. for the first, you know, bit of it so yep. that we can focus on raising a child. <laughs> yes. And we will let you guys know more of that information probably in November as yeah. we, you know, have more stuff in the can, as we have more stuff together. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, we'll we'll be talking more about the scheduling of that. But we just want to let you guys know we have a baby on the way. Yeah. Also, I would just like to say that, like, I don't foresee us talking a lot about baby. No. Uh, I think, if anything, most of the listeners know that, like, we're not about that life of no, uh, no, no, no. We're... family vloggers and things like that. So I don't, please don't expect there to be lots of baby centric content. It's yeah. not my vibe. It, it's, we, the, the biggest thing and the biggest thing that we were thinking about actually a lot, mm-hmm. and what the biggest uh, hurdle will be will actually not be so much recording time, it'll be research time. Yeah, it's research time. Um, most time. Yeah, because, I mean, each episode, while we, it's a two hour recording session, mm-hmm. uh, there's usually about, anywhere from four to six hours of research that is put in during that week by either of us. Yeah. And uh, we both won't have that time. Nope. So we've been recording episodes. Turns out babies need a lot of work. Yeah. They're going to need, they're going to need a lot of time. Mm Mm-hmm. So we're going to sit back. Also, I would like to say. Yeah. That I, since I had been keeping this hidden in a secret. Yeah. For all the reasons you keep such a thing hidden in a secret yeah. for a certain amount of time. So your husband won't monetize it. Uh, yep. That one mostly <laughs> <laughs> um, is that I felt real bad. I felt real bad in the beginning there and I do want to apologize but also kind of throw in the card of like there's a reason that the book club had a bit of a lull there. Yeah. It was really hard to read because yeah. I did not feel well. Yeah. But obviously we're getting back on the wagon with that one. Yeah, and now that but, you're, uh, now you're that was my uh, That's my belated get out of jail free card, please, is I yeah. I let the book club wane a little bit because I just could not read a book. I felt so bad. <laughs> yeah, and, and now you're doing a lot better. Yeah. It was a rough beginning. <laughs> sure was. It was a very rough beginning. I can't tell you how many times I'd be mid-sentence and she'd be like, pause, and then run out of the room to throw up. Uh, not morning. It was just all day. <laughs> All day sickness. Yeah, morning sickness is a, it's a load oh, of shit. It's a liar. They tell it's everybody. a load of shit. It's it's just whenever whenever <laughs> it's ready. Whenever, all the time. Yeah. So, um, if there's anyone out there who works for a major pharmaceutical company that has sponsorships for antacids, <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> that Mrs. P is your girl over here. I she has thoughts on every fucking antacid brand <laughs> in the world. It's, I'm saying, and how many options there are, I'm just, and, and the limitations. You can't take too many. Yes. Okay. We're not trying to get kidney stones out here. Exactly. <laughs> um, so we're very excited to announce. Uh, we debated for a long time of whether to ever even mention it, mm. uh, but with me doing the live show and with her being so incredibly <laughs> visibly uncomfortably pregnant yeah uh, mm-hmm. i mean i can't stress this lady is fucking 
<laughs> we're gonna, okay, no, I'm kidding. Uh, but we're going to have a very, very fun time uh, yeah, there at the great. show. And uh, yeah, we were just at Longwood Gardens. Uh, we just did a bunch of different stuff. We finally got to do our anniversary. Yeah, check out the TikTok to watch the video we made. Yeah, we made a we video. We had a, lo- a lot of fun filming that. We had a lot of fun baking it and uh, making it. Making it. it. I said oh. making it. Filming. I meant to say filming and making at the mm. same time. So, but of course, like with all things with TikTok, well, I put a lot of work into it, and then I was like, yeah, I'm never showing this to anybody. Yeah, don't look at it. Uh, versus if I'm just like, nah, here's a here's a news story. And I'm here's a weird thought I had in the toilet. It's like, like, here's three one million. Yeah, here's three point seven million views. I'm like, mm. thanks. Uh, that was that was me during a uh, a manic <laughs> a manic moment. So with that, okay, uh, we are ready okay. to start this episode. What are, we're doing again? Uh, exactly. You have pregnancy brain, so it's hard for <sighs> you to follow anything. That's uh, true. Which has been if you actually if you go back and listen <laughs> oh, over the no. last like, <laughs> don't go look for the Easter eggs of my. brain. If you go back, you'll hear her being like, life. um, uh, what am I, what am I talking about? Um, <laughs> oh God, it's that thing. <laughs> Where you put food a mouth? <laughs> yeah, that's happened a couple times. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, My brain is rotted. Yeah. And hopefully that means a uh, future child will be very smart because yeah. we're taking all of my th- brain. So for all of you who are coming to the show on at Helium in Philadelphia, thank you so much for all of we you who can't make it. We look forward to seeing everybody. Uh, with that being said, for next year, uh, once we are settled with baby, I'm going to start trying to plan to actually get out on the road yeah. to come to at least closer did you corners. Just, did you just say that within the pregnancy announcement yeah. that you're planning on abandoning me with your child to go on a tour? Is that what you just said? Uh, I didn't not <laughs> say that. Pearl mania, Pearl mania, Pearl mania, Pearl mania. 500. Okay, so today's topic okay. is uh, John Edgar Hoover. Yeah, okay. J. Edgar Hoover. All right. Uh, So a lot of people know him as the first director of the FBI. Mm -hmm. And that's true. Mm -hmm. Uh, He was the first director of the FBI, but he was the fifth director of the Bureau of Investigation. Oh, okay. So there's a lot about this guy that people think they know. when When you brought this up, I thought you were talking about Herbert Hoover. Oh, yeah, no relation. That's why I was thinking about Annie. Because there's like a song during the Broadway musical about Annie, Hoovervilles. About Hoovervilles. I was wondering when you mentioned when I mentioned it like a bit ago. Yeah, you're like, I thought you were talking Annie. about Herbert Hoover. But it's been so long since I've seen the musical Annie. Yeah. That I was like, well, there might be. It's a, a very good song. That's got a fun thing where they're like, you know, because he said a chicken for every pot. Yeah. And yeah. they're like, we don't even have a fucking pot, you idiot. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, maybe we will cook you for dinner since we don't have any fucking chicken or pots. It's very, it's a threat of violence in music, and that that's funny to me. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's about the Great Depression. Yeah, uh, which this guy was a big, big part of. Yeah, he was there, not not Herbert Hoover, no J. Edgar Hoover. But that was my mistake. Just no, now. no, that's fine. Um, so speaking of birth, mm-hmm. J. Edgar oh, Hoover. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, let me no. link those two forever oh, in your imagination. Uh, J. Edgar Hoover was born on January first, eighteen ninety five. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, he was a he was a January. What, what uh? What it's a sign? New Year's baby. Yeah, what sign is that? Capricorn. Capricorn. Okay. Uh, so his dad's name was Dickerson Hoover. Dick Hoover. No, Dickerson. But his short his nickname Dick. Uh, it didn't Hoover say Dick? what his nickname was. Hoover Dick. He went. It was Dickerson. Wow. Uh, and his mom was Anne Marie Hoover. Okay. Uh, now Dickerson, his mm-hmm. dad had a government job, and uh, they lived in Washington D.C. Mm-hmm. Now, one thing to remember about Washington, D.C., especially at this time, is Washington, D.C. was south of the Mason-Dixon line and oh. heavily segregated. Okay. It is something to keep in mind because a lot of people now, they think of liberal Washington, D.C., but it's like, <laughs> no, this was very much northern Virginia, Yeah, you know, southern Maryland. Like, it's it's a very, it was a segregated area uh, very, very heavily. Now, Dickerson, like I said, had that um, government job. And one thing that's very interesting about J. Edgar Hoover's birth is that um, his parents did not file the required birth certificate after his birth. What? Yeah. And that was a requirement in 1895. You actually had to have a birth certificate. Now, his older siblings, Dickerson Jr. and Lillian Hoover, they had birth certificates filed. So the parents just didn't like him. 
His they said si- forgettable. He had another sister named Sadie. Okay. Uh, she died as a toddler before Edgar was born. All right. So to- uh, Edgar, J. Edgar Hoover was actually like 12 years after his older siblings. Mm. So he's like a baby baby to the rest oh, of the family. He's like one of those accident kids that's like really far behind in age. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of. And now see, here's the thing, though, is we're already in our first conspiracy. OK. OK. Uh, because the lack of the birth certificate became part of a major conspiracy theory about J. Barack Edgar. Obama from Donald Trump. Close. <laughs> actually, weirdly close. Uh, no, it's it's a conspiracy that J. Edgar Hoover is actually black. Whoa. OK. Wow. Yeah. I was really close. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, you're really, really <laughs> close. So there's a few things about it. All right. One is that um, a woman came forward, I think it was in the late 90s. Her name is Millie McGee. Millie McGee. And she said that in the late 1950s, quote, uh, I was a young girl growing up in rural Macomb, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. A story had been passed down through several generations that the land we lived on was owned by the Hoover family. My grandfather told me that this powerful man, Edgar, was his second cousin and was passing for white. If we talked about this, he was so powerful, he could have us all killed. I grew up terrified about this. Uh, But later, as she uh, got older, uh, she became an educator and a researcher. Mm -hmm. And she pulled up more info. And she, you know, did some uh, genealogy and a few other things. And uh, she revealed this to the world, stating that Jagger Hoover was her relative. Quote, because of Edgar's anti-black history, I'm not proud of this lineage, uh, but history must be based on truth, she said. Hmm. Um, But yeah, there was a few different things. Uh, The writer Gore Vidal, uh, who also grew up in Washington, D.C. in the 1930s, uh, said famously in an interview, quote, it was always said in my family and around the city that Hoover was a mulatto and that he came from a family that had passed. Because now those Mm -hmm. are two separate. Yeah. Those are actually two separate conspiracies when they get linked together because the rumor that Gore Vidal is talking about Mm -hmm. is that one of his parents, either Dickerson or Anne Marie, Mm -hmm. had an affair with a black person. And then they don't get the baby certificate. Yeah. And then they kept the baby and then never got the birth certificate Mm -hmm. because they didn't want to lie under oath or whatever about who the parent parentage was. Hmm. There was also another rumor that, again, there was a family member uh, or there was a black family that had an, a kid and they just took the baby. So there's all these different things. Baby stealing. Okay. Yeah, baby snatching. All these different things. Now, I bring this up because while reading about this, this is kind of a common trope, especially in online history. When you claim that pre-World War II born historical figures are actually white passing or mixed. Okay. This actually happened a lot in pre-internet black publications. Okay. Um, for instance, there's a claim that still gets made today that Dwight Eisenhower was black. Mm-hmm. Um, even though both there's like his parentage and his family tree and everything like goes back to Germany and, and England, I believe. Uh, this all goes back to a picture of his mom. Um, Dwight Eisenhower's mom, Ida Stover Eisenhower, when she was a young woman in 1885, had her picture taken. And in that picture, okay. she looks mixed. Like she she just has attributes. And because of the shading and the lighting and things like that, mm-hmm. when you're looking at her, her hair is kind of curly. The the structure of her nose, you go, that's definitely, that lady definitely so is, is mixed. So is it that it just started, because it sounds like people are weaponizing this idea of like secret blackness. It's it's but a, then also you're saying black publications wrote it, so then it's like it's both. Are, are there, so it's two groups of people for different reasons saying it. Yes, it's both. Got so it. the thing is with uh, Ida Stover, when you see the one picture they always point to, mm-hmm. it's when you look at it, like, yeah, she does look mixed in that picture. But when mm-hmm. you see any other picture her of her, you're like, that's just a white lady. Like it just <laughs> she doesn't she just have looked really good there. Okay, yeah, it's just she looked really good that day. She was having a nice day. <laughs> She had good hair, good um, skin, Snopes, glowing. Snope says all of this is just generally just unproven. Okay. Because there's really no way of tying it back. But I want to bring that up because that's the first conspiracy. Like, his birth is a conspiracy okay. in some people's mind. And also, the I want to get through the idea of secrets mm-hmm. when we talk about J. Edgar Hoover. Because 
that's going to be a big part of this is the collecting of secrets. Yeah, big in the secrets. Um, so Jay grew, grew, like I said, he grew up in Washington, D.C., mm-hmm. uh, in one of the most densely populated areas of the city. Okay. Uh, it's the Capitol Hill District on Seward Square. Mm-hmm. Now, when I was reading, uh, doing my research on this and stuff like that, I was reading about Seward Square in this era. Uh, and a lot of what J. Edgar did through both schooling and through his job, he um, always stayed relatively close to home, like physically close to home. Okay. He wasn't like well-traveled at all as a kid. He didn't really need to leave D.C. Yeah. So he kind of has that like, and D.C. at this point, like I said, it's very segregated. It's also very homogenized, mm-hmm. meaning like everyone is kind of like the Hoover family. Yeah. Everyone is just white, middle class. There isn't like the most diversity you would have. It'd be like, oh, that guy's Presbyterian. Well, that guy's Methodist. Whoa, like maybe wait. there would be a Catholic around, but like it wasn't. <laughs> maybe the one wandering Catholic. Yeah, just one wandering. Get Catholic. out of the neighborhood. But yeah, it was. Yeah, I mean, a lot of shaking the fist. <laughs> yeah, we don't want any of you Catholics around here. But we want a Papist, you know. Uh, but there was there was a lot of that, um, you know, as he's growing up. So it's a very, it's. It feels open. You think it'd be open because you're in the nation's capital, mm-hmm. but it's a very closed environment. So he grew up in a bubble. He grew up in a very big bubble. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he went to school and he went to high school. In high school, he joined the ROTC, the Reserve Officer Training Corps. Oh, those kids were always the worst. Weird. They're weird so dorks. weird. Um, he then joined, he also joined the debate team. Oh, God. Yeah, he's an asshole. Um, <laughs> God, <I don't, laughs> Just, ROTC and debate? Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Um, Are you gonna debate about the the ROTC thing? I mean, where they wear the uniforms in school? Oh, oh you, you want to know what he debated about? No, what? Well, he debated against women getting the right to vote. Oh no! And he also debated against the abolition of capital punishment. Okay, great. And he's like very famous about talking about this like later. And and the debate team was very important for him because he grew up. Wait, so you're telling me in high school? Yeah. In high school, he had these views. Yes. And then at no point in maturity, he grew out of them. Because, like, high school boys stay talking about, go back in the kitchen and make a sandwich. But by the time they're in their 30s or grown, they're usually moved past that. So, so funny story. Okay. Uh, by the time he was in high school, mm-hmm. all right, uh, women still didn't have the right to vote. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, he's he is going to be, oh, he has to be 25 is when, when he's 25, women finally get the right to okay. vote. Okay. So he did, and he still doesn't have that frontal lobe development. So no, he's still not going to be there. He's just a dick. Now, here's what's, here's what's really crazy. Okay. So he had a terrible stutter. All right. So, But he wants to be a debate team. He wants to do public speaking, all these different things. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So he trains himself how to get over the stutter. Joe Biden. Exactly. Exactly. I actually had that note. I wrote, <laughs> like Joe Biden. But he, he didn't do it the same way Joe Biden did. Okay. Joe Biden worked and overcame his stutter. He went... Um, a very different way, which is also how he won most of his debates, by talking very fast. Oh, he Ben Shapiro'd it. That's exactly what I've written here, like <laughs> Ben Shapiro. <laughs> oh no, because uh, yeah, debate high school kid. That's Ben Shapiro. He's a debate bro. Oh, He's in God. the ROTC, but not the actual military. Really fast. Yep. Oh my God. Um, and he had he had like a kind of a high pitched voice as well. Like that's like when he was younger. Um, now. Uh, at the end of his high school career, uh-huh. he was voted valedictorian because he was actually insanely okay. popular. Oh, wait. Valedictorian is a popularity contest? I thought that was your best grades. So now it's best grades. But oh. in some schools back in the day, it was an elected position because it was who was going to give this speech. Mm. You know, but a lot of places, because over the years, it became kind of who had the best grades. Yeah. Uh, because they were like, uh, if we keep going with the popularity thing, we keep getting idiots. The worst person. Or uh, you would get discrimination. Uh, there it is. Yeah. So there's like a little bit of those type of things. So it's like if you have somebody give the speech at all, they'll try to come up with these type of you know heard, systems heard, around heard. them. So Hoover graduates high school. And at 18, mm-hmm. Jagger gets his first job. Okay. And it's working as a messenger at the Library of Congress. All right. Okay. Okay. Now, it's pretty cool. It's pretty it, cool right out of high school. It's pretty neat. It's pretty neat. It's pretty, I like, if I could say I did that, I'd be like, that's pretty cool. Yeah. Now, when I came across this, I actually didn't know, I know of the Library of Congress. You know, mm-hmm. it's one of those things where, again, you're like, it's the library, it's owned by Congress. And like, that's kind of like where my brain stopped. Mm-hmm. Um, but I then was like, wait, 
what? And like, I started like looking into the Library of Congress. <laughs> You're like, do I get a card there? Yeah. Well, weirdly. Mm. Um, so the Library of Congress was formed ba- because Thomas Jefferson sold his book collection to the library system. Nice. Okay. And the reason why he did that is because in 1812, the British burned down the library. Ah. And when that happened, mm-hmm. the library received his books and they needed to come up with a system of how to sort them. Mm-hmm. Now, this is before the Dewey Decimal System. I was going to say they system. didn't have Dewey out here. They didn't have Dewey Decimal, which, which Dewey Decimal System, great system. Mm-hmm. However, Dewey himself... Not a great guy. Horrible. Not a good. The man dude. was such. The man was such a fucking sex pest monster <laughs> that he was banned from libraries back in like the 1880s. <laughs> like back then, they were like, "This dude, fucking crazy." Yo, you like um, the um, like when you're in a library for most of the part, you don't really talk to anybody unless you're asking the librarian questions. Like mm-hmm. you're sitting quietly. It's a shh type of zone. So yeah. like to sex pest there, yeah, that's wild. Yeah. Wild behavior. He's just, I'm going to grip up on these ladies. He's like, let me tell you, you put the F dot D, and that's how you know you're in the fiction uh, dark something. I was, I don't know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> We're going to chalk that one up to baby brain on that one. <laughs> no, I was thinking of people keep sending in suggestions for romance novels. Oh, okay. And they they keep sending in dark romance. And I'm like, I cannot read a dark ram- romance and explain it to you. <laughs> no. No. How about BBW shifter porn? Okay, so anyway, Hoover. So Hoover is, (laughs) that's going to catch somebody. They're going to be like, what the fuck? (laughs) Um, So Hoover gets a job at the Library of Congress. Now, the Library of Congress has their own classification system. Mm -hmm. It's not Dewey Decimal. And a lot of times when you hear about Hoover, some people will say he learned the Dewey Decimal system, which is not true. He actually learned LCCS, which is the Library of Congress classification system, Mm -hmm. which is a class-based hierarchical numerical system that the Library of Congress began to develop in 1897 and finally completed in 2004. Okay, I have a lot of questions and thoughts. Okay. A class-based book system? Yeah, so, for instance, law in the Library of Congress... Class A. ...is class K... Shit, it's not even the top. Okay. Yeah, there's like 38 classes, and then there's a series of numbers that enumerate after that. So that way you start in like the general subject area. Mm -hmm. So books are moved around. This is different than like the ISBN system that you'll Mm -hmm. sometimes see in books and all those other different things. This is a very specific system. And they have so many books at the Library of Congress, so many different things that it took forever for them to finally go through and decide and they each just hierarch- finished it in the 2000s. In the 2000s is when they finished basically the the first outline. Oh my god, guys. Uh, so they're always still updating it. I uh, starting in <laughs> They're really pushing the uh rock th- forward on this. No, no, they are. They because they're always still adding stuff. I mean, music, yeah. CDs are added, music is mm-hmm. added in there, movies are held at the Library of Congress. Everything in theory is supposed to go to the Library of Congress. So if there's a document that's made or there's a book that's made, at least one copy is supposed to go into that. Oh, my God. So if I wrote a book. Yes. If I wrote a book. Yes. I could then have it put in the Library of Congress. I believe so. I don't know exactly how you go I'm through gonna the system. I'm going to write a book about how lame Congress is. Ow. Okay. And they'll file it under uh, C for basic ass book. Whoa. You know how many books are about how lame Congress is? <laughs> yeah. Like go to any fucking politics section of any bookstore. Yeah. And it's just a series of fake conservative books that have daggers next to them in the New York Times because they're all mass sold. Yep. That are all just there. Just like, I would. this is how I would Congress I'm better. Jo- Tommy Lauren. <laughs> And uh, so while Hoover's there, he's working in a messenger and he's working in one of the offices. So when people ask for like specific reports or they ask for specific books, he can find them. Mm -hmm. And this becomes very important. Hoover learns this classification system and it changes his view of the world. Yeah. Because again, it's he sees this very complex system, the Library of Congress, more books than anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. And he is able to find them. Yeah. And he goes, oh, this is it. Like, this is this is the secret. Mm-hmm. And so what he wrote, actually, in 1951, he wrote in a letter, quote, this job trained me in the value of collating material. It gave me an excellent foundation for my work in the FBI, where it has been necessary to collate information and evidence. Okay. He's filing secrets away. Yes. Okay. 100%. Oh, my God. What is he, a high school girl? 
Basically. Damn. He's like, I'm not only going to just make. He's like, I'm going to get the screenshots. Yeah. I dare you. Yeah. I mean, I can't tell you how many screenshots I've deleted. Like, probably like I could have fucking banked screenshots <laughs> over the year. But I was like, oh, I've run out of data on my phone. <laughs> so I'm like, well, I guess you're getting away with this one, Mark. <laughs> with the C or K. He knows. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so Hoover, again, is 18. He excels. He fucking destroys this job. Yeah, loves it. Everybody thinks he's so fucking great. He impressed his supervisors. He was immediately awarded with a ton of raises. Nice. And also, uh, he was put in a in, into a higher positions. He goes up uh, up the ranks of the orders department. So again, people would put in a request, and he would be able to find the books, the manuscripts, or other things in the collection. Um, and the part that was also really great about this is the Library of Congress. Like I said was only a half mile from his house. Yeah. So he can go home quickly, Mm -hmm. and it also allows him to attend law school at night uh, where he's also studying law. So he's working in a library Mm -hmm. doing this job while studying law at George Washington University to get his law degree. And that's what he does in 1916. All right. He gets his law degree, and in 1917, he gets his master's in law. All right. So one thing I noticed in here is that there was a note I saw in quite a few places that brought up how while he was at law school, Hoover became obsessed with Anthony Comstock. Mm -hmm. Do you know what the Comstock laws were? No. Okay. So Anthony Comstock was a postal inspector out of New York. Mm -hmm. He created a society. Oh, a postal society? No, it was like a person society. Okay. Like a moral society. Oh, no. And it was called the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice. All right. Now, this society Mm -hmm. uh, lobbied heavily to make certain things illegal if placed in the mail. And as a postal inspector, he could then check the mail, check the mail okay. and then make, you know, uh, arrest people. Now the things that he wanted to make illegal to mm. mail oh, man. were things that were obscene, lewd or lascivious. Okay. Now that's what a lot of people point out. Those are the top ones. Those Cause it's top. big. It's like we banned porn, mm-hmm. uh, a lot of books. So if a book maybe had like some insertion in there, Whoa. they'd be like, wow, you can't No, Ah, fuck you. And that's, he would lose his mind. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, now, it also had a ban on any publication that uh, any produce uh, production of publications that prevented uh, venereal diseases. Uh, oh, wow. Like in the schools where they don't teach sex ed and then all yeah. the kids get uh, chlamydia. Yeah. So you couldn't teach anybody about condoms. You couldn't mm. teach anybody about like how to not get VD. Oh, man. Uh, anything that would stop uh, conception. Oh, God. So again, condoms. Anything <sighs> that was like, hey, you know, like how to do the rhythm method. Any of that stuff. That's that was illegal under the Constant law. It's good to know that so much has changed. And anything about abortion information. There it is. Yeah. So basically, this guy was like, "I'm banning porn and Planned Parenthood." Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, it has a P in it. It's out. Um, that was basically his big thing. So they were opening the mail to check. Yes. Wow. Yeah, and that was regular. I mean, that was a kind of a normal. Back in the day, they were just back in the, the day. Mail. Well, you had more mail. Number one, you had more mail going through. And number two, um, the idea of privacy, which is how, you know, what Roe v. Wade was argued under, Mm -hmm. didn't exist in the same way. Yeah. That was a newer concept. (laughs) Well, yeah, because people weren't used to privacy anyway, because if they were involved in a church or something like that, like, you had no privacy. Come on. Also, a lot of houses didn't have bedrooms. Like, you just, there wasn't privacy the same way there is now. No, privacy didn't exist in the same way. But also, the side thing of that is that the idea of the male... By putting it in the mail, then you were agreeing to let the government read your stuff. Ugh. Kind of the way like the FCC still can regulate broadcast television, mm-hmm. but not cable or internet. Yeah. Right? Because by, by having cable, you're entering into a content w- contract with the cable provider. Mm-hmm. All right? So by, if you pay Comcast or Time Warner or whoever it is that you're getting your cable from, by bringing that cable into your house and plugging into your TV, the government's not touching that. But by... NBC, CBS, Fox, or PBS broadcasting that through the airs, the public air is mm-hmm. considered owned by the people. So the people are supposed to be able to use their moral basis to say like, hey, you can't say the seven words you can't say on television. Yeah. All right. So because of that, 
uh, that similar thought process was used through the Comstock laws mm-hmm. um, to ban pornography and to ban uh, basically most of the women's rights yeah, movements. There it is. A lot of it was banning women's rights. There movements. it is. It's just always the yeah the crux of the issue. Um, he uh, uh, he he opposed suffragettes openly. He was very big on that. He also opposed women's rights. Are we still talking about the dude or the... I'm still talking about Comstock. Okay. Because so... again, this is this is Jagger Hoover's hero. Yeah, this is his best dude. He hates he hates these women who are fighting for rights. Oh, God, yeah. Uh quote remember also th- this Comstock guy, mm-hmm. when Edgar Hoover is in high school and he's debating that women shouldn't have a right to vote, mm-hmm. this is who he's like using as his examples. God. So he's like the teen boys that are Pretending to be, be Ben an, Shapiro, an Andrew Tate. Yeah, it's the same general um, idea. It's why don't things change? Well, why do we just keep repeating history? Uh, Comstock quote: Through his various campaigns, he destroyed 15 tons of books. Oh my god! Uh, 284 thousand pounds of plates for printing objectionable books, mm-hmm. and nearly four million pictures of titties. Yeah, or just anything that he said was objectionable or, or obscene. Uh, he claimed that, quote, books are feeders for brothels. <laughs> what you reading for? Mm, well, you read a book, you're going to end up getting your dick sucked. Whoa. <laughs> That's how. <laughs> well, I think. With Honestly, the- <laughs> libraries should promote it that way. <laughs> I think- read a book, oh, get your dick no, sucked. Okay, I think that you are reversing the thing is that if you read a book, then you're going to become a slut. It's an anti-woman thing. It's not a pro-man thing. These women shouldn't be reading because then they're going to become I'm so (laughs) dumb. My brain is wired backwards, so I can't read it that way. Mm -hmm. But you've dealt with so much shit and bad guys (laughs) from working in restaurants that you're like, well, no, no, no. No, no, no. That's not what they mean. No, no. This is about calling a woman a slut. And I'm like, yeah, get your dick sucked. (laughs) Imagine reading Harry Potter and then getting head. You never read Harry Potter. I know, but maybe if I did. This was the problem. All right. Um, Comstock boasted that he was personally responsible for 4,000 arrests. Okay. And he claimed that he drove 15 persons to suicide in his fight for the young. And he was proud of that. The very pro-life of him. That's yes. that pro-life energy where you're like, no, we gotta let women die. So, <laughs> okay, cool, dude. Yeah. He, uh, I mean, one of, there was a few suffragettes that he basically got thrown in jail one of which i was going to go to state prison uh mm-hmm. she killed herself before the day before she was supposed to turn herself in sure a uh, few like that mm-hmm. uh because he would he was destroying people yeah uh he was a special agent of the postal service from 1873 until 1907 oh god that's a really long time uh yep and he then retired and moved to north northern new jersey uh, where he lived for eight years and then died at the age of 71 in 1915 Well, at least he died in North Jersey. (laughs) Yeah. Fuck yourself, idiot. (laughs) But also, I want to point out, like, he did, he retired at 63. Yeah. Fuck you. Yeah, dude. But also, like, all right, well, at least he boomer, like, he, like, he didn't stick around. He didn't stay too long. (laughs) That's the part where I'm, like, stuck. Also, I'm picturing Jersey City. That's, no, like, the specific it, it, No, I know it's probably because Jersey has really beautiful parts of it, especially in North. No, it's, like, Summit Hill or something. It's so nice, probably. Fuck a bag of shit. It was like the really nice part of North, Shut Jersey. Up, North Jersey. It's like a farm. God All damn right. it. It's like where the where the leaves change at the right time every year. Mm, that's almost that time. Yeah, and he just sat back there and he just drank he just drank uh And he thought hot... about the women he got that he got to kill themselves. Yeah, he just drank hot cider. How dare you? Yep. Um <laughs> so <laughs> this is this is like the space we're in in Hoover's head. Okay. Uh when he graduates from uh, college uh-huh. with his master's in law and the day it after cost him one nickel yeah the day after he graduates mm-hmm. uh, he is offered and he takes a job as a clerk in the United States uh, Justice Department mm. to work in the war emergency division um, and this is 1917 okay do you remember what happened in 1917 what was currently happening I mean we were a are we about to go to World War One soon? Yes, the United States is now in World War One. Mm-hmm, yeah, uh, there is an active draft. Mm-hmm. Hoover is twenty-two years old. He doesn't get drafted because this job is a draft exempt position during oh World War One. You fucking scumbag! Even though he was an ROTC guy, I He's know a trained officer corps. Oh, yeah, that's such. It's just it's so ROTC guy debate guy. Yep. 
oh, God damn. Yeah. Like, I can picture this guy. I've met this guy. Yeah. He's a little short, too. Oh, my God. A little short. And honestly, um, if you... To go back to the, the, the thing we talked about at the very beginning with his mm. family, if you look at a picture of his dad mm. and him, like they don't look that much alike. Uh oh. Like there is something there. So the mailman conspiracy? Yeah. It, there's a little bit of that there. I mean, his now he and his mom looked a little bit more like, but when you look at him as a young man, mm. as an older guy, he just kind of, he's old and fat. Um, <laughs> he just always, whenever you see the pictures of him from like the 50s or 60s later, like he's just an older guy. Yeah. He, look, he look, always looks like, um, what's the big slug guy from. Uh, Star Wars. Jabba the Hutt. That's how I always pick. Look, cause he's got that like flat face. He has no. I don't neck. picture him that. I don't picture him as that. I picture him as who's the old lady from Monsters Inc. <laughs> who comes out? Cause he they, that's the neck. <laughs> that's the neck. That's yeah. the neck he has. Oh, the slug lady. Wachowski. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of. That would yeah. be a great Halloween costume. Um. The so slug lady. So again, so now he's he's not in the war. Mm-hmm. He's twenty two. Mm-hmm. Um, now it's also around this time uh, that Hoover uh, the only time a girlfriend's ever mentioned in Hoover's life oh. there was definitely a girl that he is palling around with mm-hmm. um, and then uh, she that falls apart okay uh, because a guy that she is sending letters to during the war returns from the war and she immediately marries him um, immediately okay All um, right. we're never going to mention women and him again so Hoover, I just, wait, I just need you to know that when I pictured this, yeah. when I was picturing this scenario, it was the moment in the Muppet Christmas Carol where she is leaving Scrooge oh. <laughs> and they're singing the love, the love is, is gone. gone. Yeah. But in this scenario, she's like, no, you're annoying. You're obsessed with your work. I don't like you. Yeah. You keep filing my underwear. <laughs> yeah. I can't. I'm going to, there's a nice military man. He just got home. I'm leaving. Yeah. So, uh, again, he's 22. Mm -hmm. I want you to think what you were like at 22. Picture yourself A nightmare. A true nightmare. Okay. I'm going to picture myself at 22. Okay. Ooh. Yeah. All right. For the listeners out there, picture yourself at 22. If you are 22, good luck, buddy. Godspeed. Godspeed. Good luck. (laughs) It gets better. Um, At 22 years old, he's being, like I say, he's made a clerk in the U.S. uh, Justice Justice Department. He's Mm -hmm. in the War Emergency Division. And then he was immediately made head of the Alien Enemy Bureau. Holy shit, dude. At 22? Yeah. He's the head of a bureau? He's the head of the Alien, the alien Enemy Bureau. I don't think they mean aliens from the sky, do No, they, they don't. This mm. is back when they used to use alien for anyone who was foreign born yeah. who did not have U.S. citizenship. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the Alien Enemy Bureau was authorized by the 1917 Espionage Act uh, that was signed by Woodrow Wilson. Mm-hmm. Um, so after, the, after he's made the head of this... Hoover is going to spend the rest of World War One harassing immigrants who he deemed not loyal enough to the United States. Oh, good. Uh, specifically, obviously Germans, yeah, because that's who we're fighting in World War One. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of Germans living in like Pennsylvania, in New York, all these different areas. Uh, so anyone that he felt was not uh, American enough, and it's also part of uh, Woodrow Wilson, who we haven't really talked about too much. Woodrow Wilson might have been one of our most racist presidents we mm. ever had. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you know about Woodrow Wilson? Just that, literally. D- that's all you know about mm-hmm. it? So Woodrow... I always know because um, many years ago, uh, somebody brought up one of my friends that like Woodrow Wilson high schools yeah. are sometimes predominantly African-American high schools. Yeah. And it's fucked up because he was such a racist. He was a huge bigot. Yeah. He was a giant fucking asshole bigot. Um, one of the big things he he often railed against was hyphenated Americans, like African American. No, not just African. African American didn't exist as a term. So German American, German Americans, like Italian Americans, British Americans, Welsh Americans, so Irish he's, Americans, he's Polish really Americans. The Native American then. The uh, no, about no, that no. Life? He wants you to. He wants just white Americans. Mm. He wants you just to be. If you're here and you're white, you should just be white. Okay. Is what he wants mm-hmm. because what his big thing was. Um, is you had so many people coming over, especially in the late 1880s mm-hmm. uh, and 1890s, that the big fear that was pushed was that a German American uh-huh. in America will vote, you know, in a way for representatives in Congress who would then push policies that would help the Kaiser. 
Got it. A got Russian it, got American it. will vote for policies that would help people back in Russia more uh-huh. than they would help their neighbors here in America, even though all their neighbors here are Russian as well. Mm-hmm. So like it doesn't They're make sense. In neighborhoods. It's that idea right now that you currently have a lot of in Germany, which uh, there's a lot of Turkish people that live in Germany mm-hmm. that they moved there while the economy of Turkey was really bad. Um, the Germans, though, did not really make a big push to um, melting pot word I'm looking for. Uh, What's the word I'm looking for? I don't know. Come on. Integrate. Integrate. Mm. Did not really push a lot for integration. So in Germany, like uh, Turks stick out more. Mm-hmm. Um, same thing also happens in France. Like the, they just treat people from the former colonies terribly. Oh, yeah. But they're, they're called French, but they're not really given the same societal So field. this guy, uh, I'm sorry. Woodrow the, Wilson. Woodrow Wilson. He really, it's interesting to me to hear it. Like he was a big proponent in what would be like, cultural homogeny and the idea like we're all white you're you're yes. i don't want to hear about your polish day parade i don't want to hear about your irish american shit like it's ju- you're just white and like that was successful like that yes. definitely happened but it's interesting to me because now we have a culture and a generation of people that are obsessed with their lineage because like all of their culture was stripped from them by these generations before so then they're always not that they're always but there's many people that are grasping on for any type of culture whether that's like Mm -hmm. getting into like crystals or like that like all the things that people try to find that connection for others it's it's why i find it so funny that so many of the white nationalists all want want to be norwegian yeah they want to be vikings they want to be vikings and shit like that where like woodrow wilson was such an old school racist that he was like (laughs) no yeah you need to be American and American is white. Like that was his view yeah. of the world. And now like 23 and me, everybody's like, I'm 3% this. Yeah. I'm, I'm 3%. Per- per- yeah. I'm 3% and it's Ashkenazi. Like, and it's you're like, so what? It's so crazy. Cause like when I think about my personal family, like I know that, um, you know, my prior generations, when they came over, they didn't speak English. Like yeah. my grandfather fluently spoke Russian. And then the, he wouldn't teach my mom and my aunts Russian. Yeah. Because he wanted the homogeny. He wanted to be just like the Irish Catholic neighbors. He wanted well, it's also that. that. I, it's also that idea too. But of, wait, no, I wasn't done. Okay. So like he, the, he spent their lives being like, no, we got to be white. We got to be this. And then a couple years ago, like one of my aunts got a 23 and me done. And I'm like, bro, <laughs> Yeah. We could have just talked to your father about where your lineage comes from. Yeah. But because so many older generation never speak about it, they never talk about the lineage until they become a certain age of boomer where they become obsessed with it and they're on Ancestry.com and or, they're printing out pictures from like 1702 or some yeah. shit. Or, or they just drop a haymaker on you in the middle of a bar and you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, like, like your secret aunt back in France. You're yeah. Like, the fuck are you talking about, old man? My dad yeah. does it to me all the time. Yeah. The other thing, um, but for their generation and for others, um, the other thing that happens with the reason why they don't they didn't teach the language, mm-hmm. it's the idea it's basically burning that bridge. Yeah, I know. You can't go back to Russia, you can't go back to Poland, you can't go back to these places. We're gonna make this is our home here. I know, We're, but it's also crazy. No, I know. Personally, I know it's crazy. My, that, that grandfather I'm talking about I know. went back to Russia. I know, he did. <laughs> it's so funny. He went back and visited like a few times <laughs> yeah. and then supported a lot of politicians who strictly wanted to help Russia. I, like, it's it's actually insane. Wait, so he was right then? Yeah. If you're Russian, you're going to support the Russian dictator. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do me a favor. We're, do me a favor. <laughs> Speaking to the podcast we're recording that Woodrow Wilson was right. No. Why don't you say that for I'm me real saying, fast? But I'm saying you proved his point. <laughs> All right, so uh, Hoover, like I said, he's in charge of this group, the Alien Enemy Bureau. Um, His department uh, ended up marking about 1,400 suspicious Germans living in the USA during World War I. Okay. Uh, Hoover and the department arrested 98 of the 1,400, Mm -hmm. uh, and they marked that another 1,172 were arrestable. They had oh. they had a cause to arrest them. They didn't, okay, but they had cause. Uh, just so you know, that is a grand total of the fourteen hundred, even that they noticed. Uh, that's a twelve one thousand two hundred and seventy. Okay, so that's like eleven percent of Germans. They were like, yeah, eleven percent of them are fine. Oh my god, <laughs> we're gonna fuck it. We're gonna fuck up the rest of them. Okay. Um. So yeah. So. 
So after that, the war finally came to an end. Um, you know, that department gets folded in, and uh, Hoover gets transferred. Now, again, he's still a very young man. He's transferred to the Bureau of Investigation. Now, the Bureau of, of, of Investigation is not the FBI. Mm -hmm. It is not. And okay. this is the part that's actually very difficult. And it's very difficult to understand because when you Google FBI or you Google the BOI, it will always just be like, oh, you mean the FBI. But there actually is a difference between the two. The BOI was invented under Teddy Roosevelt's administration. Okay. All right. It's a break off through the Justice Department. And it was invented to deal with radicals. Mm -hmm. because uh, there was a lot of assassinations that used to happen in the 1800s. Mm -hmm. And Teddy Roosevelt actually became president because he was the vice president for an assassinated, a, assassinated president. president. Yeah. So there's that. There was also bombings and a bunch of other things that are happening with anarchists at the time. And so eventually uh, the BOI is formed. And the other reason why it was formed is because Teddy Roosevelt was creating the Federal Parks Department. Yep. Um, and he had a fight with Congress over how to use Secret Service agents. Because mm -hmm. the Secret Service, as we mentioned before in the Pinkerton episode, all those months and months and months ago, yep. the Secret Service was formed not just to protect the president. It was also formed to protect the money. And Theodore Roosevelt was like, well, I have a couple extra agents standing right here. I'll take these agents and I'll have them go deal with the land thefts that are happening because I care about this fucking land. Yeah. I'm trying to make parks here. I know. We gotta protect it. Ah! And Congress was like, you don't have the authority to do that. Um, so over time, mm -hmm. uh, the BOI was formed and that was formed to try to deal with some of these executive administrative oversight uh, areas. Mm -hmm. So that's what this originally was formed as. Because at the time when the BOI was formed, the secondary part of it is most law enforcement was truly, truly local. Yeah. So you did have a lot of problems with people crossing state, county, and township lines and getting away with stuff. Like yeah. you were saying, they go two towns over. Go two towns over. Change your name. It reminds me a lot. When I was in New Mexico, I went out uh, with some friends. We were uh, staying at this cabin in the middle of uh, nowhere. Okay. And we were shooting some guns. All uh, right. The story is already pretty weird. Yeah. We're in New Mexico, drinking heavily in mm -hmm. the middle of nowhere, shooting guns at so some camps. What you were, well, this is what you're picturing when you said, what were you like at 22? <laughs> I think I was 24. Okay. Yeah. I was definitely around the same age J. Edgar Hoover was when he's overseeing. <laughs> okay. So you're in the desert. Yep. Shooting guns drunk. Yeah. So I'm shooting guns drunk. And then one guy hands me this, uh, this shotgun and he hands me the shotgun and I'm shooting these cans. I'm like, this shotgun's really cool. He's like, yeah, that was my, uh, that was my grandpa's shotgun. And I was like, yeah. He's like, yeah. He moved out here with his brother because his brother murdered some dude who was fucking his girlfriend in Kansas. What? And I was like, yeah. I was like, what? He's like, yeah. So they just drove out to New Mexico and just lived here for the rest of their there lives. It is. And I was like, wild. He's like, yeah. That's the gun he used to kill the guy. <laughs> and I was like, I'm shooting a murderer's shotgun. It was crazy. But like that was very common because you had the distance, you had you know the, the separation of powers. So you'd have people who had got all the way out to New Mexico who would not be able to get sent all the way back yeah, to Kansas. Yeah, and like you just said about um, him is that he, people didn't leave their bubble. No. They don't, a lot of people, and to this day, there's still people that don't live leave their six mile radius mm -hmm. because once they're comfortable, that's it. Now, now the other big part of this is actually comes down. The reason the separation of the local law mm -hmm. versus the federal law and who enforces it comes down to article four, section four of the U S constitution. Oh, um, and that reads the United States shall guarantee to every state in this union, a Republican form of government mm -hmm. and shall protect each of them against invasion and on application of the legislature or of the executive, when the legislature cannot be convened, against domestic violence. Mm -hmm. Okay, yep. So all that says is that the only thing the federal government has to do is protect each state from being invaded, mm -hmm. make sure that they have a, a republic form of government, Yep. and that if there is some form of domestic violence happening, a over overthrow, a violent overthrow, 
then the government can step in. And that domestic violence part is based on Shay's rebellion mm -hmm. uh, that happened. And the only argument they had in there is whether not to say domestic violence or insurrection. That was the only argument they had over this clause. And that was basically as far as it was supposed to go under the early Federalist Papers. Mm -hmm. And all that's very important because when J. Edgar Hoover joins the BOI in his this new division that he he is gets becomes a part of, he the BOI itself doesn't have that much authority. Yeah. It's really just kind of an administrative system. Mm -hmm. And it's it really is just a bureau that's supposed to investigate is stuff. He, okay. Is he in this bureau doing his job, but like acting like he has power? So, you know, that's a really great question. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to take that answer after this little break. Okay. You know, it's actually great that we can now admit um, the pregnancy mm -hmm. because uh, you're looking rough. <laughs> You're not supposed to say that to people. No, I know. But you've been over here just like ugh, ugh, the whole time. You're like, my lungs hurt. <laughs> like the I, I want the listeners to know the amount because for months now, uh -huh. it's been it's felt almost like an FDR level thing where it's like we've been pretending yeah. that you aren't basically laid out. I used to talk shit on like, oh, the pregnant lady has to get part close. And even you would be like, oh, fuck them. And now you're like, no, they, deserve, closer. <laughs> no they deserve all the valor. Give them a medal. <laughs> I want the same parking spot as the veterans yeah. at the Target. You're like, give me that fucking purple heart. We're yeah. going to park close to the lows. I just, I'm, breathing is hard when your lungs are crammed, is all I'm saying. Yeah. You know, we're, I'm having a time, okay. but we're powering through it. We're powering through it. We're going to get to the end of this. Yeah. Okay. Um, so Wait, I had asked a question. Oh, yeah. You had a question. Okay. I was saying is that he's in this, like, what is kind of an administrative or clerical yes. place. Yeah. That doesn't have any power, like the FDA. It has, it has very little power. Li very little power, like the FDA or whatever. But is he behaving in a manner in which he has power? That's what I'm about to get into. Okay, because I need you to know that as soon as you described it that way, I started picturing him as Hugo from Bob's Burgers, the food yes. inspector guy. Yes. The food inspector guy that just shows up. And throws around dick power, but he really has no power every time Bob is like, oh, okay. Yeah. Like, because there's a big part at this time. We're, we're right at the turn. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I remember Hugo. Yeah. Um, that we're right at the turn in the U.S. government mm -hmm. of when power really goes from the states mm -hmm. to more to a centralized federal system. Like I said, up until this point, up like, like until pretty recently. Mm hmm most things were handled at the state level and the feds more or less. I mean, remember before this, Woodrow Wilson's the one who creates the um, uh, income tax jerk. He creates the federal reserve system. <laughs> okay. That's pretty cool. Well, no, don't say that. Ah! I call conspiracy theorists are going to fucking murder you now. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. No, we, uh, we don't like the federal reserve. We want our gold back. Oh yeah. Give us our gold back. Ron Paul. There's no gold left. Anyway, um, there is all these, a lot of stuff happens around Woodrow Wilson's time. Okay. That things shift. Mm -hmm. And you're also starting to get a, a pretty major shift at this time from the rural countryside uh, controlling things to you're starting to have now the shift towards modernity and now the shift of more people moving to the city. I reject modernity. Embrace tradition. <laughs> um, but Hoover is very much on the side of modernity. He is a man of the city. Mm -hmm. He's also a big proponent of the federal government. Why? He lives in the federal government. He's li yeah. he's literally been in the federal government his entire life. His dad worked in the federal government. He lived in a federal district, the only federal district, really, Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. District of Columbia. He's been around this the entire time. Yeah. And so to him, yeah, I'm. this is the government. And yeah. everyone around him in D.C. versus anywhere else, if you were in Iowa, mm -hmm. right, you would care more about the governor of Iowa than you would probably care about the president of the United States. Yeah, because one, it's more local. There's more local. It's going to have more effect on you. Mm -hmm. The governor, whatever the governor says, is going to ha happen to you faster. Yeah. Versus the idea of a presidency actually being able to shift an entire nation. That was a newer concept. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I got All you. Right. So Hoover transfers over to the Bureau of Investigation in August of 1919. Mm -hmm. 
uh, oh, sorry, in August of 1919, he becomes the head of the Bureau of Investigation's new General Intelligence Division. General Intelligence? Yep. Uh, its nickname is the Radical Division. Okay, why wasn't it just the GIs? Uh, what was GID? Oh, okay. Is the short part, part of it. Uh, GI is government issued. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but General Intelligence Division, GID, is also known as the Radical Division. And not like, radical! You're on a skateboard, man. We're like, no. that's a radical. We need to suppress them. Oh, okay, cool. And now, I said this was 1919. Mm-hmm. Now, he takes over this division in August of 1919. All right. This is right after the height of the Red Summer. Mm-hmm. Okay? Um, so that was a series of um, lynchings. That happened uh, all over America. Mm. Uh, it was about 38 of them. Jesus Christ. And part of it was um, both local, a local fault, and also part of it was the fault of Woodrow Wilson. Um, Woodrow Wilson said at the end of World War II that the greatest purveyors of communism in the United States mm-hmm. uh, will come from the uh, returning Negroes. Okay. Because basically, from this point forward, whenever black people get an idea of, hey, why, why can't I just do the same thing these guys do? Someone will yell, he must have learned that from the commies. Got it. Um, Got it. Because they went to France and were treated like humans. Yes. Mm-hmm. And they saw how people lived. And it's yeah. the same thing with the idea of the other returning soldiers. You have a shift happening all across America of people returning from being in Europe and a lot of people, like, once they've seen Paris, How You Gonna Keep Them on the Farm was a very yeah. popular song. But it was the same thing that happened with uh, black Americans when they returned. You also, this is also around the time of the Great Migration. So you have a lot of people leaving the South. Yeah. A lot of black people leaving the South and moving towards the North. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you have these, you know, neighborhoods and disruptions and things like that because of different groups of people. So you have black people moving into an area that's mostly just German and Polish immigrants. And mm-hmm. then whatever, you know, rabble rouse, rabble rouse, rabble rouse. Before you know it, you have a terrible, terrible fighting happening all over the country Yeah. Uh, at the same time. And because it would happen in one state, the next state hears about it. Two weeks later, it happens there. Mm. It seems to just be this wave that goes all over. Contagious hate. Yeah, 1919. Mm-hmm. Um, after that, we get hit by the first Red Scare. Okay. Now, the first Red Scare... It was a big push due to hypernationalism from World War One, mm-hmm. and also fears from the Russian Revolution. Okay. So when the Russian government was overthrown by the Bolsheviks, which are the communists in mm-hmm. Russia, everyone in the world who was rich went, "Oh no, that could happen." Oh no, here the proletariat. Yeah. Has come to power. So, do we make things better for the proles? No, no, you never Darn. do that. You never make it better so that they'll, uh, you can calm them down and yeah. reason with them. Never do that. Yep. Uh, so they just started. Uh, uh, they started shooting a lot of people. There it is. Uh, so the American authorities saw threats everywhere of, uh, of, com- of communists. Uh, there was issues in Seattle. There was a general strike. There was also a police strike in Boston. Uh, and then the anarchist groups started bombing a lot of people, well, including political and business leaders. It's in the name, really. Yep. And this started what was called the Palmer Raids. Palmer Raids. Yeah, Palmer. Like Chrissy Palmer? Yes, yeah, same spelling, <laughs> different guy. Uh, so the Palmer Raids were started by attor- the attorney general at the time. His name was A. Mitchell Palmer. Mm-hmm. And the goal was to suppress radical organizations. Um, and it did this by using exaggerated rhetoric. They did a lot of uh, unwarded, not wiretaps, but like reading people's mails, searches and seizures. There was illegal detentions, and they deported basically anyone who they didn't have all your paper together, like fucking send them back to Europe. Just get them the fuck out of here. Um, They didn't even know where they went. No, they did. Actually, that's yeah, that still happens today where they're like, oh, what? Uh, He's not telling us where he's going. Well, he's going to fucking Mexico. Yeah. Uh, But that's what they did to a lot of people. Um, So. You also have a growing issue of there's a huge anti-immigration issue happening at the same time. Because, again, there were so many European refugees coming over from Mm -hmm. the end of World War I. Um, And then a lot of people were coming in from Southern Europe and from Eastern Europe. So you have a lot of Jews. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of Italians. Yep. You have a lot of Poles. And you have the people here who are mostly, you know, of German, French, 
English, mm-hmm. some Irish, looking at these new groups of people who, again, are speaking different languages. And so there's there's unrest that yeah. is happening. And so there's all this anarchy happening. And then there's communists walking around be like, hey, guys, I don't have to be like this. And so Hoover and Palmer go, it's their fault. There it is. Not the fact that the president is screaming, let's get rid of all the hyphens. Yeah. Everybody just be white and speak English. Like, also, mind you, at the same time, Woodrow Wilson is also the one who is uh, demanding that uh, showings of birth of the nation. And so he actually basically restarts the Klan. Oh, my God. Uh, Woodrow Wilson was one of our worst presidents. That's, yeah. I, I, I remember the birth of the nation story now. Yeah. So uh, I do. I again, just to always bring it back to similarities, like the way that you're describing it is like um, maybe a former president yelling about pronouns. Yeah, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's their fault. It's the communist. uh, By admitting people are different, you're dividing us and we need to be unified in our hate. Yeah. Duh. Um, But yeah, so Woodrow Wilson authorizes uh, Palmer. Mm-hmm. To start doing these raids. So Palmer puts Hoover in charge of them. Great. Um, Hoover uh, sets up the first raid on November 7th, 1919. Mm-hmm. And that is the two-year anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia. <laughs> uh, so then these raids really run through the end of 1919 uh, through early January of 1920. Uh, he arrests over 10,000 people. Jesus Christ. Um, 556 foreign citizens were deported. Mm -hmm. Uh, he uh, gets rid of a lot of leftist leaders. The raids are particularly targeted towards Italian immigrants, Mm -hmm. Eastern European Jewish immigrants, Mm -hmm. uh, anyone who was considered leftist or anarchist, and labor activists. Yeah, there it is. Some of the major targets during, because it also had some black black people uh, in this too, some major targets included Marcus Garvey, Rose Pastor Stokes, Cyril Briggs, Emma Goldman, and Alexander Berkman. And there's also one guy who Hoover maintained throughout the rest of his life that this man was the most dangerous man in the United States. Ooh, who was it? Uh, his name was Felix Frankfurter. Was he super cool? Uh, he was a lawyer who eventually became a Supreme Court justice yeah. from 1932 to 1962. There it is. And, and he and Hoover will be, just be at each other For eternity. forever. Because he's considered a very moderate jurist who was like, hey, maybe we don't, shouldn't do a... Should know a secret police Gestapo shit. Yeah, it's basically what he spends his He's entire like, career oh, being like. You're you're having a special police force to arrest labor movement and people that yeah. want to unionize. Great. So in night in April of 1920, uh, Hoover tells the nation, "Okay, be ready. Oh no, because there's a massive communist uprising that's going to happen on May Day." Hoover had Twitter then. Basically, well, I mean, he had he had the press. So there's yeah. newspapers, there's radio, there's all these different He's things. He's just in. using Twitter the same yeah. way. It no, the used. same way Trump. I mean, yeah. you would see this during the end of the Trump administration, especially if every other day, or even the early Biden years, when when or the early days of the Biden's term, go back and you can go and see on Twitter. I'm not going to say X formally known as Twitter. It's Twitter. It's Twitter. Twitter.com still if, goes if to go, Twitter. If you go to www.twitter.com, yeah. it's Twitter. It's Twitter. So fuck off. Um, but anyway, uh, if you go back then, it was like every other week was like on Tuesday, they're planning to be, here. and it was like, it's just this a crazy communists shit. communists are going to overthrow. I've seen it. If you go and watch the movie Shutter Island backwards and pause <laughs> at the, an hour, one hour and 10 minutes. We're not watching Shutter Island tonight. I know we're not. Um, that'll be very funny to people in January. <laughs> uh, so the, uh, he says that on May Day. There's going to be a massive communist uprising. It's going to be, there's going to be shooting. There's going to be all this different stuff. Uh, it doesn't happen. Okay. The cops and even state militias are all rounded up. They're like ready. They're like in the streets. Everyone's fucking ready for this May Day riot that just doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. Nothing happens. Of course. Uh, except for the ACLU being founded. You know what? Cool. It's founded because of this. <sighs> These Palmer riots are so terrible Mm -hmm. that the ACLU was found. And then I gave them all of your money. Yes, basically. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, if you don't want to give money directly to the ACLU, uh, give money to our podcast and it ends up being given to the ACLU. (laughs) It gets donated to the ACLU a lot. Here's what happens. I uh, am a monthly member. So like they auto take money. I automatically give it. But also every time I read something upsetting that has to do with our civil liberties, I just text Alex that I'm giving them more money. 
Yeah. Just, and then everybody's always like, oh, where'd you get that cool ACLU hat? I'm like, they just started sending this stuff, guys. Yeah, you just have, <laughs> I have, just have so, a closet full of ACLU stuff. I have so much stuff. ACLU merch at this Which point. Which is crazy because they send you stuff because they want more money. And it's like, you're still you're just giving them money. Yeah. You don't ever give them money for it's, the merch. I would uh, love to stop having to give them money. But every day, our civil liberties Oh, are every tested. day is a nightmare. <laughs> Uh, but that's why the ACLU was founded. Yeah. Um, and in fact, shortly after their founding, they released a report titled, quote, Upon the Illegal Practices of the United States Department of Justice. And in this, they listed a lot of the illegal practices, uh, many of which uh, included agents provocateur, mm-hmm. uh, which is the idea of where you send in uh, somebody into a crowd to start, start riot, starting yeah. rioting, stuff like that, uh, which was entrapment. Mm-hmm. Uh, point out illegal detention, Mm -hmm. the illegal deportations, illegal searches and seizures, and all the other different random stuff. Now, while Hoover was leading these raids uh, in the radical division uh, as head of the GID, um, it was Palmer who ended up actually taking the political fall. Okay. Uh, Palmer oversteps a few times. Mm. He actually gets dressed down in cabinet meetings by Woodrow Wilson. Okay. Um, and at one point, Palmer actually was, people were talking about Palmer being the Democratic nominee for president after Wilson. That's a Democrat? Yeah. Woo. Oh, this is, listen, people, people, like a lot of people on the right refuse to believe in the party switch, but like yeah. what they, when they go back, like well, old Democrats were better. It's like, yeah, because they were Republicans. Yeah. Um, While Palmer's on his Kind of fall, yeah. kind of moving on his way out. Uh, Hoover was spending this time streamlining the General Intelligence Division. He w- started going through all of the files at mm-hmm. the Bureau of Investigation, and he systemized them through a series of index cards. Oh, my God. So he started creating a card filing system very similar to older geriatric millennials that we are. Mm-hmm. Or remember going to a library and there being these little drawers, yeah. little cards in them, similar to that, the way before we had computers. And this system uh, be, it would allow them to be able to quickly search through connections. So if I'm going and I'm looking at Tony, uh, Tony uh, Miscatado over here, mm-hmm. right? And I'm like, he, what was his sister's name? And it'd be like, oh, his sister's name's Jan. And like, well, Jan, she's related. And then you'd be able to quickly go through the cards and be like, she's fucking uh, Tommy Kapowski. Oh. So you could go through and make these connections a lot easier. They didn't have Facebook to. They didn't have any of these things. I mean, there's no search engines, the, any of these things. They had the, they use the intelligence agencies just use Facebook now because we all, well, not me, but like everybody puts up who they're related to and friends with on Facebook. Yeah, no, exactly. We don't need, to, we don't need Mormon genealogy anymore, everybody. No. We have... Mark Zuckerberg is doing it for Thanks, us. Guys. I mean, a lot, a lot of it's a big thing now when we talk about you know when we get all the way up to Edward Snowden and the NSA is back then they had to go through and find this information. It was a series of informants mm-hmm. was also a big part of it, but also going through and going through trash, tailing people, doing these different things, and collecting this information and how you could put together these networks. Before this moment, the federal government. Or And also, at most of the state governments didn't have a way to actually track any of these groups. Mm. So you had communists over here, you had anarchists over here, and you're like, what is their relationship? What's the relationship between these different people? Oh, there's people? probably just like a lot of infighting because people oh, picking a, picking apart, oh, you're not this enough, you're not that enough. Yep. And then it takes down the whole movement. The cards um, rapidly expanded uh, to cover 150,000 people. Jesus Christ. This is, again... We're talking about in 1920. That's like everybody. Yeah. This 150,000 people is like that. If you're in America, you're in, on an index card. It, at it this felt point. pretty close. <laughs> um, by 1939, because mm-hmm. uh, eventually these cards will be known as uh, the FBI files. Mm-hmm. Uh, by 1939, these will cover uh, 10 million people. Yep. There Just it by is. 1939. Mm-hmm. Uh, in 1921, uh, one year after the Palmer raids, Hoover was promoted to deputy head of the Bureau of Investigation. Okay. So the BOI. In 1924, the General Intelligence Division, the radical division he was in charge of, uh, that was basically deleted. It was terminated. A a lot of prominent members of the government uh, said that the GID uh, and its tactics were unconstitutional 
and many of them compared them uh, to the Tsar's secret police. Yep. Um, or the Kaiser's secret police back in Germany. They're like, listen, this is fuck shit. This yeah. is what the U.S. wants to do. Because remember, there's also a lot of people, especially coming from Europe, who are like, no, we don't want to be a monarchy. Yeah. I know that we don't. I know that now there's a lot of people here who want to be a fucking monarchy, but there was a very long time people be like, no, living under a czar sucks. Yeah. Uh, we don't want to vote for Baron Trump. Um, or or Hunter. There, I both sides. <laughs> Fuckers. Um, so while the GID was declared unconstitutional and yeah. uh, and closed, okay, Hoover kept the cards. Of course he did. <laughs> he kept the cards, um, but he also didn't care because he was then declared acting head of the BOI. I assume he killed his boss. No, his boss was. Uh, have you ever heard of the Teapot Dome scandal? No, it's stupid. Uh, yeah, it's right. Teapot Dome is one of those scandals where today we'd be like, no, that's that doesn't even make. You call that a scandal? You would look you're like it's not even trending. Like, oh my it, god, it wouldn't because it, it's it has to do with like graft, and it's one of those things. But this is during Calvin Coolidge's administration. Mm. Coolidge kind of sucks. Um, but anyway, Hoover's declared acting head of the BOI, mm -hmm. and a few months later, President Calvin Coolidge uh, makes it official, and Hoover is named the fifth director of the BOI. How old is he now? 29. Jeez. He's 29, and he's running the BOI. Okay. So the BOI was a smaller agency, mm -hmm. had uh, 650 employees. I mean, that's a lot. Well, I mean, for, for compared to other agencies yeah. back then. I mean, like to be the boss of 650 people. Yeah. It's like, pff, that's a bit of a promotion. Um, of those, mm -hmm. of all of those people, uh, 441 of the 650 were special agents. Okay. So it's not really that special if the number's that high. Yeah. So one of the things is uh, all agents are, uh, are special agents. Well, if all agents are special agents and they're not special, they're just agents. But that's that that comes all the way back to when with Teddy Roosevelt and like the Secret Service and all that stuff, because they had to be pulled out of certain areas, they're mm. put on special assignments. Got it. So all FBI or BOI uh assignments are special. So all agents are special. Oh my god. Yeah, it's 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 they're giving out trophies. Yeah. They're they basically out, are they're giving out participation trophies, is what you're telling me. Um one of Hoover's first act. Okay. Uh is to fire every female agent. Oh god. And banning the future hiring of any female agents. Okay. That makes sense. All of them. Perfect. Yeah. For the, Let me keep that on brand. For the rest of his time as head of the FBI, mm -hmm. he says, uh, no more women. Which is interesting because um, what we learned in the Pinkertons episode. Uh, yeah. What we learned in a future episode. That we recorded today. <laughs> yeah. No, <laughs> about how women. We, but Women are really good at being spies so, because no one expects them. They're the Spanish Inquisition. No so, one expects them. So one thing that you need to understand is, is there's an argument inside the FBI and inside of Hoover's own head. Mm -hmm. Often between the FBI, BOI, and uh, what else is, is this a spy agency or is this law enforcement? Hmm. Because those are actually two separate things. They're a spy agency. But that's but that's where he ends up arguing with it because, um, you know, let me explain why he fired the women. Okay, okay. because he's a bigot. So in 1928, <laughs> you didn't say no. And I mean, he's definitely a bigot. Mm -hmm. He's definitely a white supremacist bigot. Like, there's yeah. no there's no way around it. Yeah. Um, the only agency he would hire were white. Yep. Uh, they had to be about a certain age. He also had like really weird fucking like thought processes on people. So like if you had like sweaty palms, he wouldn't hire you or he'd fire oh. you because he didn't think you had like strong nerve. Got there was it. all these small things about like body language, about your life. You know, the FBI would do all these background checks. Um, if you'd used any drugs, anything like that, like you would be just canned. like all the FBI is Mormon now. Yeah, kind of. No, it is. Yeah. They like go out and seek Mormon men because they're. They seek white men that have a uh, white nationalism built into their belief system because part of Mormonism is understanding that we live in the Mecca. We live in the place that we should be defending as the birth of God. Mm -hmm. So that white nationalism leads into kind of the cult of the FBI and not questioning orders and following certain protocols. So like, I think statistically there's more Mormon men in the FBI than... They, they seek them out yeah. to work there because of it. 
Yeah, I'm trying to pull up. I had at one point a list of like things. Stuff and things? No, it was like a list of like what he required because they're, they're kind of weird. Not sweaty palms. Palms yeah. are sweaty. But I mean, like, I, knew the, I remember the sweaty palm thing, but there was like a lot of really fucked up things that were like listed in there of like he basically just wanted he wanted just a cardboard white guy that he could mold. <sighs> he would have loved like, the Mormons. He, but he, that, what's his name? John Smith or whatever. Was it John Brown? What is it? John Smith. John Smith. <laughs> I didn't come here yet, right? No, John, John Smith had already come and gone. He did? Yeah. Oh, the dates are ruining my yeah. brain. Um, so uh, here's the thing. Mm. Uh, in 1928. 1928. A new applicant. Okay. Uh, joins joins the uh, the group. Okay. Okay. So he Who joins, are they? He joins the BOI. Um, on his application, mm-hmm. he lists uh, that he only wants to become a special agent because he, to use, he wants to use this position as a stepping stone. To make enough money and to get enough experience to open his own law office in Iowa. Uh, he's going to get rejected for that one. Uh, no, he gets hired. Oh, really? Uh, his name is Clyde Tolson. Okay. Tolson becomes a field agent. Mm-hmm. And he's rapidly promoted to the chief FBI clerk. All right. And uh, was after about two years, he is the assistant director of the BOI with J. Edgar Hoover. Sure. Yep. What's this have to do with women? So, uh, remember I mentioned we're never going to mention girlfriends again. Yeah. Uh, oh. So then he didn't go out and start his own law business? Is that what you're saying? Uh, Tolson would stay at the FBI for the rest of J. Edgar Hoover's life. They were best bros. So, it's... Um, there's a lot here. Okay. This is the next big conspiracy with J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover has been alleged... Mm-hmm. Um, to be probably one of the most famously closeted men in American history. Okay. Uh, it was a pretty big open secret, and people will argue... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. So he, because he may be uh, gay, he fires all the women? Yes. Well, Come because he on. hates women, because he only wants to, he only believes in masculinity. Come on. But also remember no from the allyship. Comstock, from the no Comstock stuff and all this other stuff, like, there is a history there of, like, him... Just fucking hating women in general. Yeah. Uh, pro- he probably hated women so much that he ended up being gay. Or, like in this or he way just like because he wasn't attracted to them and he, he, so many He internalizes men, it. Well, no, because like so many men like only like what they're attracted to. Like the way that men will only be nice to attractive women because they're like, you don't have any human value unless I'm attracted to you. So if you're not attracted to women and you grow up in this society that has that belief system... Of course, you're gonna be like, I fucking hate these ladies. Yeah, because he's not attracted to them. Now, now, part of the reason why he didn't, he didn't have any girlfriends is uh, he was busy making those fucking index cards. He lived with his mom till she was fo- till he was forty three, <laughs> till she died. Well, now once she died, mm-hmm. he became even closer with Clyde Tolson. Okay, this is uh, quote. It has been stated that Clyde, that J. Edgar Hoover described uh, his days with Clyde Tolson mm-hmm. as, uh, as such. Uh, they rode to and from work together. Okay. They ate lunch together. Sure. They often traveled uh, on official or unofficial business. Mm-hmm. Uh, there, many people have described it as a spousal relationship. Okay. Uh, a lot of some people have dismissed this. Uh, the two men often spent their weekends together in New York. Uh, they would spend Christmas together in Florida, and they would be at the start of the Del Mar horse racing season together in California. Okay, this just sounds like a lovely couple. Uh, one Democratic congressman bigotry. complained that uh, Hoover and Tolson have, quote, been living as a man and wife for 28 years at the public's expense. By the 1960s, agents, FBI agents, began referring to the pair as J. Edna <laughs> and Mother Tolson. Oh, no. Uh, I like how they got the sexism in there. Yeah. Good job, guys. Do you know who Ethel Merman is? Yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, Ethel Merman was very close friends with Hugh, with Herbert Hoover. Oh, man. And uh, uh, shortly after Hoover died, uh, she she outed him. <laughs> she yeah. said, and I quote, uh, someone asked Ethel Merman what she thought about uh, gay people. And she replied, some of my best friends are homosexual. Uh, which didn't really surprise anybody. <laughs> but then she followed up with, everyone knew about J. Edgar Hoover, but he was the best chief the FBI ever had. She's a good Judy. Yeah, she's a good Judy. Um, a woman named Susan Rosensteel okay. came forward, 
and she stated that uh, under a sworn affidavit that she had attended an orgy with her husband at the Plaza Hotel. Oh, shit, dude. And Herbert Hoover was there. Okay. Dressed in full drag. Oh, my God. And she watched as he had two boys in leather read Bible verses to him. What? Before he grabbed the Bible from their hands, threw it on the ground, and proceeded to have sex with them on top of it. Oh, whoa, whoa. We went from, I was like, this is going to be a easy peasy normal orgy to whoa. yeah no it, it goes it goes like straight to leather orgy like that Woo. um uh <laughs> Woo, i wasn't the, ready yeah uh well so the orgy susan claimed that the orgy was organized by roy Cohn. who's that a uh, roy Cohn was a lawyer who uh worked for uh what's his name um he worked for uh the fucking guy uh, M- mccarthy Oh, so, yeah. Okay, so the guy, the famous guy who ran around the Commies. 50s, who was like screaming about commie, Joseph McCarthy. Yeah. Uh, Roy Cohn worked for uh, McCarthy uh, alongside Robert Kennedy. And he also, uh, who's also, op- like, Cohn was gay. Mm-hmm. It's very well known that he was gay, and he died of AIDS. Uh, his name is actually in the AIDS quilt. Mm. Uh, and it's a very negative entry. Oh, really? Yeah, it's like a crazy, it's a crazy entry in there. I don't have it on here, but I remember when I was reading it, it was like, holy shit, it's a, it was like a fuck you to Roy Conan, like in the middle of the AIDS quilt. You know what? Yeah. That's, because he died That's the the petty shit that lives. Yeah. Roy Cohn's uh, clients included Rosenstiel, as well Mm -hmm. as uh, Fat Tony Salerno. Not Fat Tony. Roger Stone. Okay. Wait, what? Yeah. Rupert Murdoch. Okay. And Donald Trump. (sighs) <sighs> okay. Roy Cohn actually is pretty famously is like is the person who ta- like explained to Trump how to how to be a dickhead. Oh, God. Like that's actually comes from I would love from, to thank him for that. Yeah. Um so yeah, so <laughs> that's that was the that was the orgy. Um uh Susan's husband by the way was uh Louis uh Rosensteel. And in this, in the book I'm quoting here, I just want to just read this because the book is "Bad Gays: A Homosexual History." Yeah, uh, this this is the beginning of this. Susan's husband, Louis Rosenstiel, was a powerful bisexual businessman. Oh, <laughs> like that's, that's how they quote him. I just love that. Yo, listen, put that on your LinkedIn. Um, a powerful bisexual businessman. Yeah, so, I just go- I'm googling the quilt. I need to know what it says. Oh, the Roy Cohn quilt. I mean, Did I you find look, it. No, I'm looking for it right now. Oh, it says Roy Cohn, bully, coward, victim, is sewn into his quilt. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, bully, coward, victim. I think that's just like such a. It's yeah. So amazing. They're honoring the fact that he was a victim. Yeah. But that doesn't take well, away from everyone, the fact I mean, that he was a if, hateful coward. Yeah. I mean, if you die from AIDS, you're a victim of AIDS. Yeah. I I like the the the. They had more grace than all of us, yeah. all right? Because I would have been like, fuck Roy Corn. He's not going to my goddamn quilt. Yeah. You, but no. Well, um, no, because that the real pettiness is putting it on the quilt. Yeah. Forever. Yeah, forever. You fucking coward. Uh, but yeah, that's that's from Bad Gays, A Homosexual History by Hugh Lemmy and Ben Miller. Let's it's say, actually a very- looks like a really cool book. It's a pretty good book. It's it's pink. I got it from the library. Yeah. Uh, it's pink with like a, a, it goes through just a history of just different evil men who- Who's the statue on the front? Uh, I think that it's a Roman emperor. I want to ask you a quick question. Yeah, I think it's Hadrian. It came up on the messaging in the in- inbox. People want to know. Uh-huh. People want to know. How often do you think about the Roman Empire? So <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. Yeah. Uh, now, a lot more. There, but I, because okay. Because every time I'm scrolling through TikTok, yeah. it's coming up. Yeah. I will say... That a lot of the quote thoughts of the Roman Empire, it's algorithmically based forced thoughts through the options that I'm being given because I like history. Mm-hmm. Uh, and because I like history, some of the top history content makers on either YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, etc. Yeah. They know that Rome is instantly, they're going to get X number of hits. Yeah. It's just we like people gravitate towards Rome and there's a big thought process about that. So I think if the internet didn't exist... I would probably say a couple times a month, depending on the type of book I'm reading. Yeah. Okay. But because the internet exists, I'd probably say three or four times a day. Yeah. 
But I, I knew, I've always known that the number was going to be high. As soon as the trend on TikTok started, yeah. the how often do you think about the Roman Empire TikToks? When I saw the people were like, I don't know, like once a week. And I was like, oh, the, cowards. Per- Perlman's? It's in yeah. a day. How also, many in a day? Also, I do want to be clear. My mom was a Latin teacher. Yeah. So my mom was a fucking Latin teacher. The dinner table. My early, like <laughs> most of my trips, like when I was old enough to go on like trips, yeah. we went to like Roman sites. Like yeah. that was like where we went. We would go to Roman villas. We would go to, you know, anywhere where they're like, oh, there's a new site that just opened up. My mom was like, can we go? Yeah, of yeah. course. My mom, Lily Summers in Italy, digging up Roman yeah, she does places. excavations. Yeah. She do Roman excavations. Also, like when we went to Longwood Gardens, we didn't put it in the TikTok, but like one of the funnest places to go is there with your mom. Yeah. Because all of the flowers' names are written in Latin. Yeah. And she knows all the historical reasons for yeah. most of them. Yeah. So that and like the flower show. Yeah. She also knows from reading the Latin, she'll be like, well, that word actually means this. So really, like, that when you translate this directly from Latin, it actually is donkey ears. Yeah. And we know them as, you know, plantains or whatever. Like, yeah. like she knows like some weird way of Yeah. And then she's things. like, well, actually, Caesar really is some, but you're like, well, like she's got, is she, that's you and her share that yeah. little one of my pocket mom's, of Rome in your my, brain. One of my mom's favorite things Which to do. Which is funny because neither of you are Roman. No. Uh, <laughs> one of my mom's absolute favorite things to do mm-hmm. is uh, to go to cathedrals in yep. Europe yep. and read tombstones. Yeah. Because most tombstones up to a certain point are all written in Latin because yes. that's the church language. So she loves to just like walk around. She's like, I can read this shit and no one else can. And I'm yeah. like, what well, mom? I mean, we all have Google Translate now. She's no, like, it doesn't matter. You. She is... Yeah. Warding it over everybody. Everyone. I don't know anyone like that. No, no one at all. <laughs> uh, so yes, I do. I do think of. I do think of it probably more often. Also, I have like some small Roman statues around. So like yeah. every now I'll catch one. I'll be like, Oh, Romulus and Remus. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, they weren't real. Okay. So they back, were made up later. <laughs> back. Sorry. Sorry for the segue. Yeah. No, it's fine. Um, where was I? Oh, uh, so yeah, so, so there's a lot of, I was reading, um, there was a book, I don't have it in front of me, uh, that I was going through for some of this research and, uh, it was written by Hoover's, uh, an FBI agent that was like the kind of like Hoover's assistant. Okay. Um, and it's incredible. It's a great book. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but it also is clearly a man trying to whitewash and like set the record straight oh, on okay. a bunch of fuck shit. Cause like the thing is, is like Hoover's evil. Yeah. Um, but he goes through, he does mention the gay rumor and he's like, not true. Like he just like, <laughs> they always, every, I was, I was sitting, I was sitting next to Tolson. Everybody said he was his uh, Hoover's gay lover. Not true. And it's like, well, uh, when Hoover died, Tolson inherited his estate uh, and then moved into Hoover's house. Mm-hmm. And when uh, there was a U.S. flag draped over Hoover's coffin, uh, that was handed to Tolson like he was his wife. Uh, Tolson then went back to Hoover's house where he, kind of moped around and when he died he was buried very close to hoover's grave Mm -hmm. and it's pretty clear that he died because the love of his life was just gone like they might not have been butt fucking but like there was something there yeah um you know so there's definitely they were in love they were in some type of relationship they're definitely in some sort of relationship also like um maybe i can no he's such a bad person that i'm like i don't want to give him any credit but i'm gonna say that it's incredibly difficult to uh, work with your life partner. Yeah. <laughs> so for them to be like going to work in the office every day. They and were running home, the FBI they're together. They're running the FBI together, doing like running 650 special agents and then going home and going on vacation in New York and Florida together. Like, yeah. They must have been compatible. Yeah. Oh, they have more than 600 by this point. Um, <laughs> uh, one, there is also in Bad Gays, it is mentioned, uh, one FBI agent, uh, gay, a guy named uh, Guy Hoddle, uh, was Clyde Tolson's flatmate uh, for years before he joined the agency. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was a constant companion of Tolson and Hoover's. They were very all very close. Uh, he made similar claims that they were, uh, you know, uh, about the orgies and shit like that. Now the hotel, uh, hotel, uh, was a problem alcoholic though. Oh, um, however, Oh, what he was never fired for being a problem alcoholic. Well, probably because he knew so many goddamn secrets about Herbert Hoover 
jerking off on Bibles while Leather Boys beat him. Oh, who hasn't been but there? But there was a lot of accusations about <laughs> uh, Herbert Hoover being a cross-dresser. And the thing is, is to keep in mind, again, we're living in a world of secrets. And so how great would it be in this secretive world where Hoover, Herbert Hoover is keeping all these files on people if you are the one who knew that not only is he secretly black, but he's secretly gay and he also wants to be a woman, which is why he lived with his mom. Yeah. So like, even if it's not true, it becomes part of that world. I also just like feel like, I mean, I don't know it to be true, but like if he's the king of secrets, right? Yeah. And like weaponizing secrets. That's oh, his weaponizing thing. too. Extreme. That's his thing. And like knowing how powerful secrets are, it makes me think that he wouldn't even be in an orgy with people. Like they didn't have NDAs back then. They didn't, like unless unless he had little index cards on everybody in that room ready that's the thing, to fucking go. That's like, the thing though is I think he would have index cards on every single yeah. person in that room. I I'm dead serious. Like yeah. I actually do believe that he would. Like, like I I picture it like Putin. Like you would have yeah. to know that every single you would have to know everything about every single person in that room so that you could get rid of them at any well, moment. Remember, Putin was a member of, is a K, is ex KGB guy who yeah. ran the FSB. Mm-hmm. So he was basically, imagine if J. Edgar Hoover became, was installed as the president one day. Mm -hmm. That's Vladimir Putin. Yeah. And then he said, you're voting for me every time. Every time. Um, but yeah, so basically this whole, this bad gaze, there's some things in here that's a lot of it's uh, gossip. A okay. lot of it's rumor. Oh my God, And then great. a few of these books. There's another book I, I had here, The Gossip Men. Uh, yeah. And this one right here. Gossip Men by Christopher M. Elias. Uh, which is about Jagger Hoover, Joe McCarthy, Roy Cohn, and the politics of insinuation. Mm -hmm. uh, I got some good notes in there from it. This book um, also like glances on the fact, uh, and they both kind of make the same uh, big point, which is uh, while there's all these rumors about him being gay, uh, there are no rumors of him ever having a girlfriend. Well. Besides that one. Besides that one very, very early on during but, the war. But she love is gone, Dim. Yeah. <laughs> She was um, probably like, wait a minute. Yeah. This guy. Also, well, also, there's lines later, like when certain lines, they, they would say that he loved to wear lavender, which they called Eleanor Blue. Oh, yeah. Eleanor Blue. Yeah. Eleanor that's Blue was not lavender. lavender. Well, that's the way it was described in the book. Eleanor like, Roosevelt. She became, yeah, yeah. Uh, she was like um, a socialite. She's a yeah, very yeah. popular young woman. Yeah. And she got all of her dresses made in this very specific, it's like a light robin's egg blue. Yeah, but apparently he wore wear, that a lot. Yeah, well, that, she made this. Okay, wait, listen. Yeah, she made that color in vogue. She okay. was the it girl of the time. She was like seventeen, beautiful, rich. She was like Paris Hilton. Okay, she was slash X living. Okay, and so she got custom dresses always in the same color, different fits and cuts and like frills and all that. But so she became so synonymous with this color that it became in vogue across all the different like New York, Chicago, DC yeah. scenes. So again, learning from gay culture, RuPaul's Drag Race, men that want to dress like famous women that are wealthy, thin, and beautiful, of course he would wear that color. Of course yeah. he would. Um, He's like Valentina. But also it's one of those... Which you're not going to understand I'm that. I'm not going to understand that. That was a that. very good joke. But also it's one of those things in, uh, in Gossip Men they point out is like, uh, gossip columnists are mentioning that about him that he's wearing Eleanor blue which was code for I mean, he's gay yeah and there's so there's all these different lines in there but it was one of those things where like if you weren't in the know like much like Liberace who's very if you see a video of How Liberace anybody not know Liberace? Uh, listen Come on. is right in their face uh but you know these Iowa boys they don't know <laughs> um so anyway uh where are we oh my god um all right so it's the 1930s mm-hmm and a few things happen in rapid succession. Okay. Very, very rapidly. Mm -hmm. um, the Great Depression. Yep. The car becomes cheaper okay. and more accessible. More accessible. Tommy guns. Okay, great. So we've got cars guns. and we've got guns and we've got depressed people. Yes. What could go wrong? Uh, criminal gangs begin to <laughs> rove the United States, <laughs> robbing banks yeah, 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 where yeah. they're outgunning, outdriving, and outmuscling all the local cops. Let's fucking go. <laughs> um, and the thing is they're robbing banks and everyone hates the fucking banks because the banks not only just destroyed the economy, mm -hmm. while they were destroying the economy and stealing, and there was no FDIC back then. Yeah. Uh, while stealing everybody's savings, they were also foreclosing on all these farms and like people are losing their homes. So these these robbers come through and rob these local banks and 
Maybe they gave out some money. Maybe yeah, they, they didn't. Robin Hooded it. Yeah, but they're being treated by Robin Hood in the local newspapers. Yeah. Um, now Hoover is starting to like lose a little bit of power because he, he's not doing great in the papers. Got it. The BOI isn't doing great either. And people, and he's like, I need to go after the, I, these are the guys I need to stop. Yeah. If I can stop these guys, then the FBI is going to look fucking great. And yeah. like, that's the problem. Remember I read you that constitutional amendment earlier. Yeah. Like they don't have jurisdiction. So finally he's able to push and he gets some of their offenses listed as federal crimes, so like stealing a car and driving it across state lines. Boom. Robbing the multiple banks across state lines. It's it's the across once they cross the line. So if you yeah. only rob in Texas, the FBI can't get you. But if you drive yeah, to but like, fucking Tennessee. Yeah, if you kidnap somebody and drive across the border, then you know, across the state border, and now it's a federal crime. Is this the the laws that they're citing when they're trying to pass these um anti-abortion laws where like if you drive to a different state the state can sue you and arrest yeah and you? actually we'll get into more of that uh in a little bit when we talk more when we talk about the man act okay okay um so hoover pushes for this juris- uh, jurisdiction and he finally finally gets authorization for the boi to hunt down criminals okay cool and immediately Can't the special agents they just start fucking up they yeah. just start fucking up uh, they can't catch anybody, but eventually, mm-hmm. out of the Chicago office, a special agent named Melvin Purvis starts tracking down and now either capturing or killing these famous criminals, uh, including Babyface Nelson, Pretty Boy Floyd. But his most famous um, criminal he killed was John Dillinger, who he shot down the streets of Chicago on July 22nd, 1934. Okay. It's so, again, law officer... For federal government, yeah. shooting criminals without trial. Yes. Yeah, okay. Now, in some of these cases, some of these guys had killed. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were dangerous and all these different things. But but it's the precedent itself. But sets. also, this is where you get the public enemy list mm-hmm. begins because of the newspapers and things like that. Hoover starts really working the press. Yeah. Um, he starts to make waves in, in press and be able to get people to write uh, good stories about his agents. His agents started to be called the G-Men for government men. Oh. And Hoover's known as the number one G-Man. Um, and with the murder of... The number one G-Man? Oh, yeah. You point to the bad <laughs> gays. Yeah. Um, with the with the, with with John Dillinger being gunned down, yeah. that becomes a very big one. Because, I mean, at the same exact time, you also have like Scarface. That Scarface is in the FBI. Yeah. Al Capone's not the FBI. That's the Treasury Department. That's the IRS. Yeah. That's the Treasury that's Department. That's the IRS. <laughs> um. I think Bonnie and Clyde, I think, was the U.S. Marshals. Mm-hmm. Like, there's different groups. Like, that's all these ever guys are jockeying for who is going to be the premier group. Yeah, so they can take a picture. So they can take a picture. Um, so Hoover gets really, really upset. Okay. Because people really start talking about what a fucking macho, awesome dude Melvin Purvis is. Oh, Melvin's getting the glory. Yeah, so uh, Hoover chases Purvis out of the BOI. Um, oh, he and, can't let the spotlight shine on anybody else. Yeah, he can't. RuPaul. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, what, but they've caught a string of criminals, and in fact, Hoover himself at one point claims also, that just he like, catches. Real quick, like yeah. when I think of macho men, they're never named Melvin. <laughs> Here's the thing, uh, Melvin Purvis. Yeah, this dude's fucking macho. He's man. macho, dude. Uh, Melvin Purvis. When you, if you would ever see a picture of him, you'd mm. be like, Yeah, guys. Uh, that guy's a lot. Like, go ahead, pull him up. I'm like, gonna Google it. Uh, during World War II, like he was an intelligence officer. Like this dude, dude just straight up like mercs people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He's, yeah. He yeah. looks pretty cool. Yeah. He's got some swagger. He's got the hat. He's got like when you think of like a 1930s FBI man, like yeah. you think of Melvin Purvis. Yeah, he looks like, oh, he looks like that one bad guy that always does like the slicked back hair in all the movies yeah. from the 90s. Yeah. Or he would be on Peaky Blinders. Yeah, exactly. Just yeah. beating the shit out of a guy. Where is John Dillinger? Yeah. Um. Also, this was around like my favorite time because I actually, when I was a kid, I used to read a lot about the FBI mm-hmm. from the 30s because I thought it was so cool. Um, I thought Tommy guns look really cool. Yeah. Uh, and I knew I didn't want to, you know, obviously the, the mob guys and the gangsters, they're bad guys. Yeah. So you want to be the good guys and you want to be the FBI. So I used to read all these books about <laughs> the FBI and John Dillinger's escapes and mm-hmm. all that different stuff. I was obsessed with it as a kid. 
Um, so then like, as I got older and it was like, okay, well, I mean, that's really great. They, you know, they stopped all this crime. And then I was like, huh, they really just fucked. They really just went for them symptoms, huh? Yeah. They're yeah, really going after them symptoms a lot. Yeah. Uh, and that's the difference between being a boy and being a man. <laughs> Understanding the difference. Yeah. Um, so Hoover was finally secure, uh, in his job now because they caught a string of criminals. Mm-hmm. He is now, uh, well known across the country as the director of the BOI. He got Melvin out. So he got all the shine. Yeah. He has all the shine. Um, he's, you know, any agents that he felt weren't great. He fires. Mm-hmm. Um, he makes sure that his agents all also have like a very stage managed look. So like they have to have like their hair cut in a certain way. They have to have clean nails, like all this different stuff. Like when you're an FBI agent, you can't look like a bag of shit. Yeah. Um, uh, because his view of it, and especially was kind of true back then, is you go to some of these small towns, they would have a sheriff, and they'd have night watchmen, and then you'd have like some day guys. But like you didn't have when an FBI man came into town, you wanted him to have a very specific <laughs> suited look. Yeah. And this was all stage managed and stagecraft by Hoover, because Hoover was like, "We're gonna get the frame right." And I was like, "The more I'm saying it, I'm like, this guy's gay as hell." <laughs> um, but he, he it, likes a, he likes a good fit. He likes a handsome man. Yeah, groomed well with the nails and the yeah. good haircut. Yeah. I understand. I respect that. But there's nothing else I respect about this man. No, everything else is uh, is terrible. Uh, so in 1935, okay, the agency, the BOI, is renamed to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Mm-hmm. Uh, now there is a actually a change there. Because one of the big things is the BOI goes from just having the special agents and just having the file system to adding in crime uh, laboratories Mm -hmm. and uh, the FBI fingerprint lab is added, uh, different ways of how they uh, go and look over um, evidence. Yep. Uh, and also more file collection on Americans. Perfect. So many more files are collected on Americans. Perfect. Um, Now, one thing you may have noticed Mm -hmm. as we've been talking through this thing. Um, I've never mentioned the FBI and the mafia. Well, I mean, bread and butter, peas and carrots. Yeah, it's because uh, Hoover never admitted that the mafia existed. Well, if you don't admit they exist, you can't be compliant in what's going on. That's honestly, you're very smart. Um, <laughs> that's actually a really good way because the thing is, is Hoover needed wins. Yeah. Uh, is what some historians have said, mm-hmm. is J. Edgar Hoover needed wins early on. And how can you take down a shadowy organization that nobody can admit is real, yeah. right? And like, also, the other issue he had is he's only hiring white Protestant guys. Yeah. So he's not hiring Italians. He's not hiring Jews. He's not hiring people who could go into those neighborhoods. Yeah, he's not hiring women that he, could really slip into those neighborhoods easily. He's not hiring any of these unnoticed. people. Unnoticed. Yeah, any of these people are not getting a job. So he literally has the, the FBI men who are stage managed look perfect to play in Prioria on the these local movie theaters. Yeah. When people get together or they hear about them on the radio, they're not seeing... They can spot an FBI. Man. Yeah, it's like when you see somebody, you're like you know, when you can spot an undercover undercover cop like yeah. so easily. Yeah, and you're like, you're a fucking cop. Yeah, that's a cop. And you're like, bro. Yeah, bro, bro. <laughs> Come on. Um. So, uh, Hoover never says the FBI. Ex- I mean, the ma- mafia existed. Mm-hmm. Um. One, like I said, the first reason was that he needed the wins. Yeah. And he didn't want to admit to the world he couldn't catch them yeah and number two uh is an accusation that uh meyer lansky Mm -hmm. who was a jewish uh mob member Mm -hmm. uh had incriminating photos of herbert hoover cross-dressing and getting fucked in the ass by clyde tolson that is a very specific and pointed reason yes unlike the first reason which was kind of just like a overarching. It's like a nebulous, like, oh, yeah, well, that makes sense rich strategy-wise. Yeah, okay. Then now the second reason yeah. feels really pointed. It's really specific. <laughs> it's a pretty specific thing. Yeah. Um, so Meyer Lansky is was known as the mob's accountant. He mm-hmm. was a he was a member of the Jewish mafia. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was connected with Lucky Luciano, uh, who was big head of the Italian mafia. Yeah. Um, and they formed a group called the National Crime Syndicate. Bro, the branding. Yeah. The branding. Uh, it was nicknamed Murder, Inc. <laughs> I'm dead serious. I'm... Well, yeah, I knew that because then when they made Murder, Inc. records. Yeah, exactly. It was it named after there. this. Yeah. 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 Um, but but just so that people don't know, the National Crime Syndicate, which is which was a real thing. Yeah. Uh, it was a union 
of different ethnic mobs yeah. who came together. So it was the Jewish mafia, the Italian mafia, uh, the black and the Irish mafias, like those those different organized crime groups all kind of came together to discuss turf. Yeah. Um, you know, these are bad guys, but, you know, they don't have to be bad guys. Listen, they understand that uh, business needs to get done. Yeah. I just picture that um, scene in Batman when the Joker comes in and they're all like all the different mobs are at the table. That's exactly what it is. It's exactly what it is. Um, So uh, I'm noticing that we are we've we've run pretty. Yes. Pretty tight. Yeah. And uh, I haven't even touched on World War Two. Okay. Um, So with that being said. Okay. This will be Mm -hmm. our first long form two part episode. Oh, shit. Yeah. So Mrs. Pearlmania with that. We're going to go to bed. <laughs> yeah. We're going to take a break. We're going to go to bed. We've announced a lot today. We've yeah, said a lot today. We've said a lot of things. Is there anything you this like? This isn't even the first podcast we recorded. No, this is our second <laughs> podcast recording of the day. We will record. So uh, this is the end of part one. Part two will be out next week. Next Sunday. Uh, next Sunday. We will have that recorded uh, and posted after the Helium show. Mm-hmm. Uh, any parting words of wisdom for all of the Pearl Mania Patreons and listeners and all that fun? Everybody have a great week. Um, keep smiling. We're doing this. Yeah. Guys, thank you so much. And keep it frosty. <laughs> keep it frosty. Okay. Can we go get frosties? <laughs>